like to start by remembering somebody who was very, very dear to us, Swami Agnivesh, a mentor and a beloved friend to so many of us in human rights movements in India and around the world, and also interfaith causes for justice. Swami Agnivesh was a lifelong fighter for the rights of the most marginalized in India and the world, particularly bonded laborers. He was beaten up a few times in recent years by Hindu nationalist mobs. He left his body on September 11th, just a few days ago, just shy of his 81st birthday. If Swami Agnivesh had been here and hale and healthy, he would surely have been a speaker in, the, in our conference. Let us infuse every panel of this conference with the fighting spirit of Swami Agnivesh and of justice. And now, a warm welcome to all our attendees to the inaugural conference of the Reclaiming India Alliance's conference, Reclaiming India at 73. Reclaiming India at 73, Indian democracy at a perilous crossroads. We hope to make this an annual event. The five core organizations that have come together as the Reclaiming India Alliance are Indian American Muslim Council, India Civil Watch International, Global Indian Progressive Alliance, Students Against Hindutva Ideology, and Hindus for Human Rights. I'm also grateful to all of our supporting organizations and media partners for standing with us. There's a slide that shows our wonderful supporting organizations. I wonder if you could see that. Thank you. Let's just take a second to read, to read over these names of incredible organizations. Many of them are in India and it's, um, it takes a lot of courage to put your name on powerful dissent. Throughout the course of the two days of Reclaiming India, you will hear from brave activists and visionaries from India and their counterparts in the United States. We are especially inspired by and grateful to all those who are speaking from India directly in spite of the grave risks that must be recognized. Before I invite my brother, Dr. Manish Madan to share his welcoming remarks, I'm tasked with going through some ground rules. The full conference program can be found at our website, reclaimingindia.org. Some panels are pre-recorded and others are live and panels will be interspersed by delightful and moving musical interludes. You will use the same link that you joined with today, tomorrow as well. We will not be seeing members of the audience or hearing them because there are too many of you, um, but there will be the question and answer feature where you can type in your answers and wherever possible, often during the sessions, um, we will, speakers and organizers will answer your questions. And we promise that any questions we don't get to, we will find the answers from the speakers and publish the answers on reclaimingindia.org and we pledge to that. Other than the brief introductions of speakers that will be made through the conference, um, we are not reading out the full speaker bios, which are at the website reclaimingindia.org. We urge all of our panelists and organizers to mute their audio and video while another session that is not theirs is, in, is, is happening. Um, we want the speakers to have their video on and all the rest of us who are organizers and speakers to have our videos off and muted. All the full, I mean, what we are showing in each panel, each recorded panel, is an edited version of a, a, a conversation that is at least twice as long, sometimes three times as long. And we will be showing um, the full conversations in the weeks to come. So please look out um, on the various Reclaiming India platforms for the schedule of those screenings. These conversations have been incredible and I invite all of you and urge all of you to join us for those briefings, those uh, broadcastings. So now um, I just want to welcome everybody again and um, pass the mic to Dr. Manish Madan of Global Indian Progressive Alliance. Again, welcome everybody to Reclaiming India at 73. 
Good morning, friends. Hey, am I audible? Am I clear? Is my audio clear? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, good morning, friends. Before I say a word, I like to draw a twenty-second moment of silence in the memory of all victims of rape, murder, and sexual violence in India. Also, remembering the most recent horrific incident that happened in Hathras, Uttar Pradesh. As I ask you to go into that moment of silence, I also want you to remember the father of our nation whose birth anniversary we celebrated yesterday and ask yourself, are we living in Gandhi's India anymore? And what are we going to stop do to stop this menace of violence against women in India? The 20 second starts now. Uh, all right. Uh, on behalf of the entire team of Reclaiming India, I welcome you to this inaugural edition of Reclaiming India Conference. This is Dr. Manish Madan, Professor of Criminal Justice at Stockton University in New Jersey. But here, and importantly, I speak as a private citizen and as founder of the Global Indian Progressive Alliance. As progressive Indians, we stand for bringing people together towards building progressive communities driven in the pursuits of facts, liberty, rationality, advocacy, and social justice. We aspire for progressive values beyond the lens of religion, caste, ethnicity, race, gender, etc. Our anchor, like many of us, hinges on education, advocacy, and social justice. Reclaiming India began in many of our heads a while ago, and it came to fruition when some of us sat down, ideating it, spending hours thinking about what do we want to look India for? What does reclaiming India mean to all of us? And why is it so important in today's time? So here we are, and allow me to give you a brief introduction on that. Reclaiming India, as my colleague, Ms. Vishwanathan pointed out, is a joint initiative of the Global Indian Diaspora, representing diverse voices, issues, identities, and their intersections. We have strong roots in the country of our origin, and we all stand by the constitution of India. We are also committed to India's foundational values and preserving towards building a democratic, plural and progressive India. We do so by adding a united voice of the Indian diaspora in support of our brothers and sisters in India who are on the front lines of defending India's secular constitution. With our exposure and global lens grounded in Indian values of brotherhood and unity and diversity, we want to see India as a forward-looking nation where each and every member of the community has an equal opportunity to grow and succeed irrespective of their religion, ethnicity, caste, gender, sexual orientation, social and economic classes. This diaspora coalition is a growing body with its roots today in all continents and countries and has emerged as an umbrella for many voices. Voices that all say in unison that India must grow out and meet the expectation of its people. The last man and woman who sleeps hungry, the child who cannot get education, the people who cannot afford good health care, the youth who cannot get employment today or have the necessary skills required in the 21st century world. Reclaiming India also has emerged as an initiative to be a voice of many Indians who find value in the core basic and fundamental tenets described so beautifully by Mahatma Gandhi. And he said, and I quote, for I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. And I unquote. And today we all stand here for reclaiming India that values each and every life that grounds itself in universal truth that all men and women are created equal and let there be light to guide us through these dark times. While this is an inaugural conference post COVID pandemic, we hope many of you will join us in a physical space in the subsequent years, where we talk about issues that matter. And that should matter to India. For example, India is today ranked as the most dangerous country for women for writer study. We have about 30% of our world's hungry population who cannot afford three square meals a day. 
none of our educational institutions appear in top 300 institutions across the globe. We rank at 102nd, much behind our neighbors when it comes to our hungry population. Our healthcare is ranked dismally at 145 rank out of 180 some countries. So while our long-term goals as this global and diaspora alliance is to bring this narrative at the forefront and make meaningful and substantial changes to our country, for our beautiful people deserve much more from the polity and the governance, far more than a single point communal agenda and misguided policies of people in power today. We have worked very hard to create some very interesting panels cutting across different themes on both days and are grateful for each prominent member who have joined us from India to kickstart this in each inaugural conversation. Each panel has an action item that we hope that many of our viewers will pursue and take it upon themselves as the cause on behalf of Reclaiming India. The conference will also conclude with an extra innings where we will discuss the political future of India beyond the high keys and the railway platforms. What we do is out of love and passion for our country and a deep desire that our country must grow and our people must progress together, notwithstanding their race, religion, caste, sexual orientation, etc. So while in closing, there is no question that India belongs to one of the greatest civilizations, but let us not forget that we must work together to keep it moving forward, to keep it great and as a forward looking nation. And therefore we invite you to this long journey ahead of us. Welcome aboard. Over to Rashid. Over to our colleague, Mr. Rashid from IMC. Actually, Khalid, Khalid Bhai from IMC. I'm sorry, yeah, over to Mr. Khalid Ansari. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madan and uh, Sunita for starting the event and everyone for joining the event. Uh, so thank you again for so much for participating in this event today to celebrate our shared goal of reclaiming India. I am representing the Indian American Muslim Council, the largest advocacy organization of Indian Muslims outside India. IAMC was established to promote our common values of pluralism, tolerance, and respect for human rights that form the basis of the world's two largest secular democracies, the United States and India. Today, India's democracy is facing an existential threat. This threat stems from the fascist ideology of Hindutva and its deep nexus with crony capitalism. Hindutva is distinct from Hinduism, is pursuing its fascist goals by targeting India's institutions and destroying its plural character. On behalf of IAMC, I would like to thank you for your resolve in combating this hate-filled ideology. The, dev the, the devastation caused by it, this Hindutva virus is not limited to the religious minorities, Dalits and Adivasis, but also the economic misery is heaped on the poor, including women, students, and the working class. The demonetization caused immense suffering to the poor and the owners of small businesses, while the ill-conceived and ill-executed lockdown uprooted millions from their livelihood. The migration of such a large number of people from cities back to the villages actually made the pandemic worse. Instead of timely relief to those impacted most, the Hindutva diehards were busy stoking Islamophobia and empty ritualistic shows of national resolve. Criminalization of dissent has intensified in unprecedented ways in India. And the closing of Amnesty International is yet another blow on civil society, human rights, and free speech in India. The following facts demonstrate how deep the problems are. As many as 42,480 farmers and daily wagers committed suicide in 2019, an increase of about 6% from the previous year. At least 10 Dalit women are raped every day in India. On an annual basis, at least 3,500 Dalit women are raped across India, a third of which are from Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. About 21 million salaried employees lost their jobs during April to August 2020, per the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. With more than 6 million cases and 100,000 deaths, India is battling the second largest coronavirus outbreak in the world. And yet the government continues to mislead the nation that it is doing a good job in serving the people. There is an urgent need for the global diaspora community to unite, speak up and rescue Indian democracy from Hindutva, fascism and crony capitalism. Thank you once again for your time and efforts 
by working together for this common cause, we can and we will come true. We will see come true the idea of India as envisioned by Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar, and Azad. Thank you, and I now invite uh, Dr. Roja Singh. Thank you so much, Khalid Pai. I believe in an India envisioned by Dr. Ambedkar, who states, ours is a battle not for power, but for freedom and reclamation of human personality. I am Roja Singh. I represent Dalit Solidarity Forum in the USA, and I also teach in St. John Fisher College, Rochester, New York. At this moment, we acknowledge the pandemic of sexual and caste-based to violence against Dalits in India that predates the virus. We gather as a global community of human rights defenders and we condemn the rapid increase in Dalit women unable to defend rights to our bodies and self-respect as we are repeatedly devalued, raped and mutilated. Just three days ago, it was yet another death following a horrific rape and torture of one of us, an innocent young Dalit girl in Hathras, UP. It is no coincidence that the predators are upper caste and male. They chose to perform this cultural ritual of exhibiting a habitualized caste-based masculinity rooted in Hindutva. We strongly condemn such a pattern of horror structurally backed by state actors and political machinery. We mourn with a grieving family and friends left daughterless, powerless, and speechless. We are outraged by the police burning her body as a Dalit woman who did not even deserve a loving goodbye from her family. In 2018, almost 3,000 Dalit women were raped. 871 of them were minors. Eight Dalit women are raped every day, at least. Justice will begin to rise on the horizon when caste-based identities, rhetoric, and pride are destroyed as Dr. Ambedkar imagined it to be. We are now going to observe a moment of silence, remembering victims of rape and violence, and also the 99,773 Indians who've died in the COVID pandemic and many lives destroyed that remain unaccounted for, and for the countless victims of communal mob violence, police brutality, rape, and sexual violence and caste atrocities. I am pleased to recognize Suchitra Vijayan of the Police Project, who will introduce our much anticipated inaugural speech to throw open this exciting virtual conference with over 1,000 direct attendees from all across the world, plus Facebook Live. Over to Suchitra. Can you hear me? 
Yep, you're good. I want to thank the organizers of this event before I must introduce Mr. Guha. Reclaiming India is an ambitious title and one that raises far more questions than it answers. What India are we talking about and what are we reclaiming? The range of speakers, interlocutors and scholars who will be speaking over the next two days is a testament to the kind of ambitious project the organizers are trying to pull off. Bring together diverse voices to disagree, articulate and think. Today I'm tasked with introducing and later responding and engaging with Mr. Ramchandra Guha. It's a difficult job to introduce someone like Mr. Guha. He's a historian and author and one of the country's most read public intellectuals. But today I'm choosing to introduce him as a citizen of the democratic, socialist and secular Republic of India. I'm also going to introduce him as a dissenting citizen who on the 20th of December took to the streets and joined the protests against India's new Citizenship Act and was later arrested. He was however lucky he was released. Right now, there are hundreds, if not thousands of young people, writers and scholars and activists who remain imprisoned for exercising their right to dissent. So today, like many Indians, I thank Mr. Guha for using his enormous platform to talk about the social realities of the present. Today, I look forward to listening to Mr. Guha discuss the Modi regime and the destruction of India. Mr. Guha, the stage is yours. Thank you, Sujitra. And thank you all uh, for being here. And thank you particularly to the organizers of this event. It's a great privilege uh, to be speaking at the Reclaiming India conference. Now, like many of you, I get up in the morning and uh, scan the news, um, both on, uh, on my phone and my computer, and also since I'm a relatively old uh, man on print. And two items this morning struck my attention, which speak directly to the theme of the conference and particularly to my talk, which is entitled How the Modi Regime Destroyed India. The first news item was from Forbes magazine, and it was highlighted, I beg pardon, it was titled Modi's Economic Failings Dim India's Five Trillion Dollar Dream. Modi's economic failings dim India's dream. That was the first news item. The second item was a tweet from the famous director and television personality, Karan Johar. And it said, drawing inspiration from our honorable prime minister, from whom we also seek sustained guidance, we, the members of the film fraternity, are privileged to announce our plan uh, to celebrate the 70th uh, uh, year of Indian independence in 2022. Now, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Karan Johar had the permission of the entire film fraternity to express his devotion and worship of the prime minister, but he did so. Now, these two news items, the Forbes story on a declining economy and the self abasement of a very prominent, successful, famous, rich Indian in front of the prime minister, partly encapsulate what is wrong with our country today, and of course, who and what has caused it. The Forbes article documents in detail the Modi regime's economic destruction. I quote, as prime minister, Modi has been unable to manage an economy veering into trouble. Nowadays, conversations overseas, that's outside India, focus on whether India could be the first member of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China to get downgraded to junk status by rating industries. So India might be the first member of BRICS, the once much lauded BRICS, to be downgraded to junk status. With consumption, exports, private investment, and other key growth engines spluttering, it is not clear how Modi plans to stabilize the economy. Now, an earlier speaker talked about some of the absolutely disastrous um, economic policies of the Modi regime, demonetization being one, the unplanned, arbitrary, and premature lockdown, which led to enormous amounts of suffering earlier this year being the second. But it's also to do with Narendra Modi's, the, the economic destruction of India that Modi has oversaw, in fact, you could even say directed and orchestrated, has to do with the capture and destruction of Indian institutions. The Forbes article talks of the Reserve Bank of India, which was one of the few Indian institutions uh, that had been sturdily independent uh, in earlier regimes. Uh, but there's also the Election Commission, uh, the investigative agencies, even the Supreme Court. As I wrote recently in an article in the Indian Express, the Supreme Court is in danger of becoming a collaborationist court. 
the fact that it has not yet heard uh, you know habeas corpus petitions of democratic leaders in kashmir uh, that children in kashmir don't have access to the internet everyone else does in india or one year after the abrogation of Ab uh, article 370 they don't have access to the internet only to 2g and i don't know how they could study with that kind of access uh, the supreme court has not even heard the constitutional case on the civil citizenship amendment act nor on article 370 so there's the destruction of the economy there's the steady emasculation of the institutions and the current johar court shows in many ways the degradation of india's democratic ethos itself fear of vengeance and retribution has silenced our most famous and successful people and this is i think a striking uh, a, a substantial difference from the situation in the united states where you also have a demagogue in power uh, whose intentions uh, hopefully not for much longer but he's been in power for the last 4 years who wants to destroy institutions who has had a huge a uh, negative impact on the social fabric who has created a cult of personality around himself but successful american stand up against him brave sports icons african american as well as from other communities have publicly protested against him famous actors have spoken out some entrepreneurs have spoken out you recall when there was the ban on immigration from six muslim countries the ceos of you know microsoft google and so on talked about it this is it conceivable in india are the more famous the more successful the wealthier the indian the more cravenly submissive and sycophantic you have to be i baba saheb ambedkar in his last speech to the constituent assembly famously warned indians against hero worship he said bhakti in religion is a root to the salvation of maybe a root to the salvation of the soul but bhakti in politics is a root to eventual dictatorship and ambedkar continued in that speech he said however much an individual's contributions to a society do not lay down your liberties at his feet now we indians disregarded his uh, his caution and his warning when we laid down our liberties at the feet of indira gandhi you know a period when i was a college student and have some memories of also a period i later studied as a historian but narendra modi is indira gandhi on steroids in his vindictiveness his uh, his um, his red, his policies of retribution his disregard of expert advice um, his emasculation of public institutions and in the creation of the personality cult around himself you know it's it's astonishing it may even be the greatest personality cult in history greater than any personality cult created even in a communist dictatorship so you have uh, the destruction of the economy you have the degradation of our public institutions uh, you have you know the impoverishment of our democratic ethos itself uh you know there are many other examples i could give if you take uh, you know uh the example of pm cares uh uh a wholly illegal public fund created by the prime minister where uh, thousands of crores have been collected and again through threats and intimidation public sector institutions have been forced to give money every employee of a public university has had to contribute whether they like it or not and there is absolutely no transparency about how the money is used and the astonishing thing as is that is that the supreme court also has not asked uh you know for for any sort of of transparency so what we see is a uh, a steady systematic this degradation emasculation uh weakening of the institutions that act as a check and balance to democracy the democracy is about more than elections some years ago uh, shortly before narendra modi came to power i described india india as an election only democracy by which i meant uh a party comes to power a leader is elected and for the next 5 years he or she is absolutely immune to public scrutiny 
or largely immune to public scrutiny. This is true even of, in some of our states. You know, some of our states are also run in a uh, relatively authoritarian manner. There's a centralization of power in the chief minister and his or her office. There is intimidation of the media. There's the summoning of public institutions. Civil servants and bureaucrats are appointed not on the basis of uh, uh, competence or domain expertise, but on the basis of loyalty to the leader. But Modi has taken it many steps further. I think this is important to recognize that the undermining of institutions, intermediate institutions, like the media, like the civil service, like the police, like the, the judiciary, like parliament, had started before Modi came. And uh, it, you know, had started before Modi came, but they've accelerated, deepened, become more dangerous and had a much more devastating effect in the six years since Modi is in power. So the destruction of the economy is the fact that we've gone from one of the fastest growing countries in the world uh, to fanciful claims that India and China will be the kind of growth engines of the 21st century uh, to having a negative growth rate of almost 24% in the last quarter is largely attributed to Modi and uh, his, his grossly mistaken policies. Uh, our democratic ethos, our public institutions, and to these must be added the assault that the Modi regime has conducted on India's already vulnerable social fabric. Again, as a historian, I don't mean to say that these problems did not always exist. From independence, India has had, Indian society has had, has arguably, and I'm not going to rank them in any order of vulnerability, but has had their four discriminated, disenfranchised social groups in India. These are, as I said, in no particular order of importance, uh, Dalits, Muslims, Adivasis, and women, women cutting across, but even women in upper caste homes and Hindu homes uh, and urbanized homes are face the burden of uh, Indian patriarchy. And Modi did at his regime, the Bharatiya Janta Party, the RSS did not invent Hindu or Indian or Islamic patriarchy. Modi and the RSS did not invent discrimination against Dalits that goes back centuries. Um, discrimination against Muslims is also, discrimination against Muslims particularly has greatly intensified ideologically not just politically and at the ground level, but also ideologically in the Modi regime. Uh, I think what happened last year, uh, the persecution uh, uh, of the Kashmiris and the abrogation of, through the abrogation of uh, Article 370, which is a clear message that India cannot have, Modi's India cannot have a Hindu, uh, uh, a Hindu country cannot have a Muslim majority uh, state. It can have Christian majority states as in the Northeast, it can have a, 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 a Sikh majority state, as in Punjab, these exist on sufferance, but a Muslim majority state is absolutely inconceivable, followed by the Citizens Amendment Act, which was illegal, immoral, and absolutely discriminatory. So I'd say that in particular, the demonization, the disenfranchising of Muslims, the threats, the intimidation, the harassment has massively intensified uh, since Modi came to power six and a half years ago, alongside have been the attacks on Dalits and women. Uh, we we uh, <coughs> started this meeting by uh, observing uh, respectful silence in memory of, of the victim uh, of uh, upper caste violence in, in Hathras. And if you look at, if you look at what the response of the UP police was, I mean, it was that a state could hide the traces, not even allow the family to have a dignified cremation of someone who let, had such an awful death, uh, could now tell lies about what happened, to seek to cover up things, to corner off the whole district and keep everybody out so that no one can come. Most recently, to demonize a brave female journalist who first shone the spotlight on this awful atrocity is a sign of the absolute visceral majoritarianism, a majoritarianism that is religious, 
uh, that is caste based and that is patriarchal. The fifth, uh, you could say, dimension of um, India that the Modi regime has undermined is our environmental security. Now, there's a great deal of talk, of course, rightly about climate change. And uh, almost the only true thing Donald Trump said in the last presidential debate, almost one of the few true things he's ever said was India's lack of responsibility when it comes to global climate change. But the domestic environmental problem is even more grievous. Uh, our rivers are biologically dead. Air pollution in our cities is the worst in the world. And Narendra Modi will not, even though he lives in Delhi, has done nothing in six years to set in motion the economic and technological uh, transformations that are needed and that are available and that are relatively cost effective to bring down air pollution in Delhi, something that, you know, uh, an affliction that uh, leads to millions of deaths over, a, uh, you know, in, in Delhi and otherwise. And under cover of the pandemic, we are seeing the devastation of, um, the absolute devastation of the forests of central India. There's some outstanding reporting by the brave and fiercely independent journalist Chitrangada Chaudhary on an Adani plant in, in central India and the dispossession of the Adivasis and the destruction of millions and millions of uh, old growth trees. And it's done under cover of the pandemic. So you have the economic failures of the Modi regime and failure is too mild a word. The malign economic policies that have destroyed 30 years of economic growth, the fruits of 30 years of economic growth, the further emas emasculation of our public institutions, the corruption and corrosion of our democratic ethos, the attacks on minorities, Dalits and women, and the destruction of the environment. That's five aspects of how Narendra Modi and his government have degraded and destroyed India. And finally, our place in the world, our place in the neighborhood and our place in the world. Now, India lives uh, in a complex, difficult and challenging neighborhood. We have long-standing border disputes with Pakistan and China, and we have fought wars with both countries. And these disputes are complex and of long-standing. And in my book, India After Gandhi, I describe them in great detail. They are the deep animosities underlying it, and it's not easy to solve them. But we had great relations with Nepal, and this so-called Hindutva regime has destroyed amicable relations with a Hindu country in the neighborhood. Uh, Bangladesh, a country we helped bring into existence. We've alienated them by we, I mean, our government has alienated them by through particularly through our arrogance, our condescension, and particularly through the Citizens' Amendment Act, who, in, in whose framing and in whose propaganda, the Home Minister essentially said every Bangladeshi is a turbine. So we've lost the neighborhood, uh, you know, we, even Maldives. And of course, our standing in the liberal democratic world has precipitously declined uh, because of the intimidation of the press, the harassment of uh, civil rights organizations, and uh, the abrogation of Article 370, uh, going back on a solemn constitutional promise, and the Citizen Amendment Act, which is everywhere being seen as what it is, despite all the spin the ruling party has tried to put on it, the CAA has been seen clearly and starkly as what it is, a discriminatory piece of legislation when read along with the nas proposed National Register of Citizens will make Indian Muslims, the large community of Indian Muslims, second class citizens. So I've eliminated for you six ways in which the Narendra Modi regime has degraded, uh, weakened, uh, shamed our republic. Let me take myself and all of you back 12 years. When India celebrated its 60th anniversary of independence in 2007, there was a great deal of cheerleading. And the cheerleading was, you should say, led by people of the town where I live, uh, you know, uh, Bangalore, entrepreneurs of Bangalore who said, look, who kind of gloated. They said, once upon a time, India was bracketed with Pakistan, 
We have dehyphenated India and Pakistan and bracketed with China. I, we are just back from Davos. I met one of these entrepreneurs back from Davos and he said, look, in Davos, they're talking about Chin India, the Asian century in which India and China will kind of march along together. And I warned my friend, I said, look, firstly, uh, let's give some credit to the politicians who laid the foundations of the Republic to people like Gandhi, uh, Ambedkar, Nehru, Patel, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Sarojini Naidu, and so on, who laid the basis of a democratic and plural society. Uh, without national unity, without pluralism, without freedom, you could not have had the economic growth you have. And secondly, I also said, it's rather premature to see us as claiming the world. And you know, the fall since 2007, I mean, uh, is extraordinary. It's absolutely precipitous. And it's, it tells you where we are today and what where we were when Narendra Modi and his party took power six and a half years ago. Now, I don't mean to say that Narendra Modi is the sole architect of this slide and this fall. Uh, it's, he's had accomplices in his party, the opposition has been extremely weak, but he has certainly played an absolutely central role. Now, you, some of you will remember that at the time of the 2019 uh, elections, Atish Tashir wrote a brilliant cover story in Time magazine where he called our Prime Minister divider in chief. Um, now, as a consequence, he lost his OCI status. And I salute Atish for his intelligence, his sagacity, and his bravery. But I want to say to my friend Atish that in the 18 months that have passed since his original piece, uh, he, have, he was somewhat euphemistic in his assessment of Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi is not merely the divider in chief, he is the destroyer in chief of the Republic of India. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goha, thank you so much for that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to respond looking to the future and what we do. And as you laid out for the last 25 minutes, what you really did was, um, it was the proof of the existence of the monster is its victims. And what you did was lay out the various victims, which is institutional. The only things I would kind of add to that is the idea that the idea of data security, um, the date idea of subjects of citizens of India being turned into subjects and then turned into mineable data who are then sold um, the our absolute sense of what it means to be there. But I'm also going to put a few other questions why I know this event is called reclaiming India. But I have publicly said this many times that I no longer believe that the Republic, while I also introduce you as a citizen, as an act of a citizen of the socialist, secular, democratic Republic of India, I worry that the democratic India that I was born in, the one that so many of you have written about and many others fought for, perhaps no longer exists, that the Hindu Rashtra is perhaps already here. So how you fight a Hindu Rashtra, a fascistic regime or an authoritarian regime, is very different than how one fights a democracy. In a democracy, you can protest, you can take to the streets, dissent is not sedition. So how do you think one fights this many headed monster? That's the first question I'm gonna to put to you. So uh, it's a very important question uh, and a very sharp and perceptive question. Let me answer it to begin with as a historian. Uh, the last time we experienced something like this was during the emergency, which I lived through as a college student, which I've studied. And what are the parallels and departures between now and the emergency? Uh, what offer us glimmerings of hope and what make us feel more despairing? Now, what offer us glimmerings of hope are that in the emergency, Indira Gandhi and her party controlled every single major state of India, except Tamil Nadu, which soon they dismissed the government. So this called control the whole country. Today, the BJP and does not control large parts of South India and significant parts of Eastern India and no longer Maharashtra after last year. So space for a pushback exists geographically, territorially, in, democratically in five, six or seven major states of the Republic. The second, you know, uh, aspect, uh, difference between the emergency and now, which offers us a glimmering of hope, 
is the existence of social media. Now, social media has very pernicious, awful aspects to it, but it also allows the a flow of information. What happened in Hathras? Indira Gandhi and Sanjay Gandhi could have stopped any transmission of news immediately. Now we are here discussing it. You, all of you, all over the world, know the what the barbaric nature of this regime because of brave journalists, reporters, and the amplification of their voice through social media. So those are two aspects in which the situation is slightly more hopeful than the emergency. But there are other, also other aspects in which it is much less hopeful. hopeful. And I just give you three. One is that there is no coordinated opposition. And I must say this bluntly. One of the differences between 1974, 75, just before the emergency today is Rahul Gandhi is not Jayaprakash Narayan. We, there's no kind of mobilizing a credible uh, figure who can mobilize a countrywide opposition. A second difference is that Narendra Modi is much more systematic in his ruthlessness than Indira Gandhi ever was. He has an apparatus called the RSS, uh, and it's, uh, 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 you know, so in that sense, it is, it remembers, resembles sort of uh, the Italy of the 20s and 30s. And I wrote a recent piece comparing uh, Mussolini's Italy and Modi's India today. And the third and the most dangerous difference is what you talk about. That Indira Gandhi, for all our faults, and there were many, was not a Hindu majoritarian. She understood and respected the religious and linguistic diversity of our country. Apart from Hindu majoritarians, the Modi regime are also Hindi majoritarians. They want to impose their language on everyone. And Indira Gandhi had traveled all over India. She had been studied with Tagore. So she knew something about this, right? So uh, and in that sense, the last aspect is, as you point out, particularly dangerous. Because even if Modi and Shah and Adityanath go, the poison they have left behind in the minds of ordinary Indians uh, will remain. And that remains our greatest challenge. Now, I, as you pointed out, you know, it was rare for me to uh, go onto the streets. Uh, I was inspired or moved by uh, the brutalization of the students in Jamia and JNU uh, by the police in Delhi, which I again saw through social media. And because I'm a biographer of Gandhi, Hindu Muslim unity is vital for in, in my mental frame. So I don't want to prescribe. I mean, I cannot prescribe. Uh, you know, I'm a scholar, I'm a writer. I write in the press to communicate my views. I care deeply about the degradation of our republic. But I, it's wrong for me to prescribe, except to say this that we need a coordinated opposition. We need to not only political opposition, but moral and intellectual and ideological opposition, which your wonderful uh, conference is helping us to begin. Uh, Professor Goa, I really want to go and have uh, kind of um, ask you about this idea of opposition. Perhaps we are thinking about this opposition in a wrong way. Yeah. Why should we, why should they, I mean, I'm actually, um, I've been a critique of um, the Congress policies. But I do think that Rahul Gandhi and his sister yesterday trying to make an effort mobilized, if not for political reasons, at least because there's media behind them. But apart from them, can we think of resistance as beyond political resistance? Can we think of resistance that individuals take on? Because eventually, I cannot rely on just opposition leaders to fight for my fight. So how would you respond to that moment of people as the act of resistance? You're absolutely right. I mean, I think uh, the anti-CA protests were exhilarating for that reason. You know, uh, the day I was uh, detained, there were several hundred people uh, in the det detention center with me. There were students, there were lawyers, there were Muslims, there were Hindus, there were Christians, there were young people, there were middle-aged people, and there was no one from the Congress party, even though the Congress is the major opposition party in Karnataka. Uh, but the pandemic crushed that hope of a kind of, you know, in a sense, a countrywide uh, decentralized uh, organic resistance from the bottom up, led by remarkable young, young, young leaders, you know, across India of different kinds. And the pandemic allowed the Modi regime to get after them. Now, of course, most recently with the amendments to the FCRA Act and so on. But I completely agree with you. I think uh, civil society resistance, even individual acts of defiance, you know, um, if you go back to the emergency, the day the emergency was implemented, Fali Nariman, who was additional solicitor general, resigned. Uh, Bagaram Tulpole, who was general manager of the Durgapur Street plant, resigned. Shivaram Karan wrote a letter, the greatest Kannada writer ever, 
the greatest pub, Kannada public ever, wrote a letter, incredibly moving letter about returning his Padma Bhushan. So absolutely. But because the, the reason why political parties are important, Suchitra, is because of how much the Modi regime has emasculated other institutions. You can't rely really on the media. You can't rely at all on the Supreme Court. And so politically, one has to defeat them at the ballot box also to begin the process of reclaiming India and then going on to rebuild India. Uh, Professor Goha, I think we are very close to the end of the time. So I'll just have a concluding remark and then a, a very short question. Uh, the question of electoral democracy. Um, having read about the CDs of the consensus, whether it's the VV Pats not matching, the electoral bonds, the Election Commission of India, from, who's one of the most respected institutions, almost abdicating its responsibility. I fear that perhaps even that electoral system is so rigged that perhaps the elections is not for us, that we also have to think about other things. Having said that, since again, as we're running out of time, what do you think are the acts of, um, because are the call on all of these sessions is to end with one thing that everybody can do or take away. What is your ask for Indians in India and also the global diaspora, what can they do? You know, uh, your, first about elections, yes. I mean, at, at the least you add, I like electoral bonds, you know, which are basically crony, the crony capitalists funding the regime. You know, a friend of mine was joking, you know, and most jokes today are bitter and satirical jokes, not jokes that you, you know, you want to laugh about. I was joking that AAP is not the party of, um, not, not the party of uh, Kejriwal. It's the party of Modi and Shah, except that it's called Adani Ambani party. That is AAP. And that's, you know, that's, the opacity of the electoral process and all that's happening around us is that. Uh, you know, again, so I agree with you that there's a problem with elections. There's a wonderful civil society organization called the Association for Democratic Reforms. I urge all of your uh, viewers and listeners to go to their website. They have a series of brilliant proposals that can be enacted without a constitutional amendment to make elections freer, more transparent, uh, accessible to the common person. They were endorsed by a previous chief election commissioner, Dr. S.Y. Qureshi, who's one of the best CECs we've had. But of course, this election commission won't take it. So even elections, we can't push back against. You know, but I will, again, with due respect, apart from saying that individuals, communities, social groups must uh, resist, apart from also warning everyone against the poison of Hindu majoritarianism. Uh, in our neighborhood, Islamic majoritarianism has killed Pakistan's prospects. 40, 50 years ago, Pakistan was actually more economically self-sufficient than us. It had a vibrant, creative culture. I mean, we used to watch their dramas and their films and so on. They had a, and I think wedding fate to state will destroy all of us. And that's why uh, I'm happy uh, for the participation of many groups in the organizing uh, uh, committee, you know, Dalit activists, uh, Muslim activists, and also Hindus against Hindutva. I would, that's the one thing I would warn my fellow Hindus, that going down the path of Hindutva, you think it will put Muslims in their place, but it will damage and destroy you as well. Uh, Professor Goa, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Um, this is a private ask. I will end with a private ask is that I think someone like you, who is well known, um, going to protest and being arrested, made it to the New York Times. I hope, as somebody recently tweeted, the streets are raging again. As the streets of India rage again, I hope you will again extend that solidarity, take to the street, because you taking to the street means that it gets all the media. Thank you so much. And I thank organizers for this same thing. Suchitra, please continue. Uh, I'm also tasked um, with the job of reading an important solidarity statement for Kashmir. The following is the statement for Kashmir. The fight against Hindutva should not be a fight to return to the status quo, but create a better community built on justice, freedom and equality. The fight should acknowledge the long years of military occupation and violence endured by the Kashmiri people, the recent Tersetla colonial project, and their ongoing struggle for freedom, dignity, and justice. 
The abrogation of Article 370 and 35A was accompanied by an unprecedented communication blockade and digital siege, the longest in the history, and a tool of repression, which the UN called a form of collective punishment without even a pretext of precipitating offense. I want to thank the organizers for organizing the event and also giving me the opportunity to read the statement. Thank you. Thank you, Suchitra. Thank you, Dr. Guha. And thank you to everybody who is with us today. As you have um, understood, the groups that came together as Reclaiming India are a diverse group of diaspora organizations, each with a different mandate. What unites us is our love for India, the country that our families hailed from, and our deep concern for the crisis of democracy in India and our commitment to stand with those in India who are bravely fighting for human rights, religious freedom, indeed, their very lives. As Indians fighting for the survival of our democracy, we do need global allies and global awareness. As Indian Americans, we need to stand with other minorities in the USA who are fighting for their rights and their lives. I am so excited to share, to announce this opening plenary, a conversation between Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi and Reverend Dr. William Barber, building the beloved community, an inclusive, egalitarian, and peaceful democracy. Namaste everyone. I'm Sunita Vishwanath of Hindus for Human Rights. It is an incredible personal honor to introduce this opening plenary of the inaugural Reclaiming India Conference. We are a coalition of Indian diaspora organizations with our hearts desirous of peace and justice in both our lands, both our homes. And I couldn't think of a better or more important conversation to ground the conversations we will present over these two days. Professor Rajmohan Gandhi is a historian, a biographer, an educator, and a grandson of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. He is also an advisor to Hindus for Human Rights. Reverend William Barber is a Protestant minister and a co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. And he is continuing the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The fight for justice, democracy, and truth is a moral fight. There is too much that is wrong in both countries. Racism and anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States, Islamophobia and casteism in India, and a disregard for the lives of the poorest of the poor and a scary religious nationalism in both countries. In India, we have a Hindu nationalist government and we are careening towards the destruction of our democracy. We have asked Raj Mohanji and Reverend Barber to help us recalibrate our bearings especially our moral bearings, our spiritual bearings, before we launch into the many panels and plenaries that make up our Reclaiming India conference. Not to solve all our problems, but to point the way. Whether it is white people, black people, Latinx people, and all others in the United States, or Hindus, Muslims, Dalits, Christians, and all others in India, the question is, how can ordinary citizens come together to change course towards a more just and compassionate democracy? And I request both our speakers to especially focus on how to work with the majority population 
when that largest segment of the population seems averse to the path of equal rights for all. I am honored to present Professor Rajmohan Gandhi and Reverend Dr. William Barber. As, as my dear sister was talking, I, and I was thinking about India, America, here we are together today talking about justice. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, one, I think it's Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. And then it goes on to describe it being like the morning dew and like being anointed as you would anoint um, a, a king, actually, interestingly enough. But it's this sense of there's something great about it. There's something holy about unity, particularly unity, not to be a mob, but unity to be a movement for, for justice. And then lastly, um, my morning scripture that I read every morning, because in some ways it connects me with all of the religions of the world, because it does not talk specifically about one historical figure, i.e. Jesus, but it talks about the spirit. And we all have a relationship when we talk about the spirit of God, if you will. Um, every religion has some concept of the spirit of the divine. And in my tradition, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the spirit has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, deliverance to the captive, to set at liberty those who have been bruised. And then it says, and to declare that this is the, year's law, the, the year of the Lord to act. In other words, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, the year in which God says, I'm tired of all the division. Everybody is welcome. I'm going to put that witness in the earth again and again and again and again. So with all of that, I'm just so honored and humbled to be able to be here with you today. In the year 1936, that is 84 years ago, uh, Howard Thurman, mm -hmm. this amazing man, theologian, philosopher, he was then Dean of Rankin Chapel at Howard University and his wife, uh, Sue Bailey Thurman and their friends, Edward and Finola Carroll. They met Gandhi uh, in the Western Indian town of Bardoli, 1936. And Gandhi had a wonderful companion secretary, a man called Mahadev Desai, who was with him for 19 years by this time, from 1917 onwards. And he says that Gandhi was more excited about meeting this delegation of African-American figures than he had been for any other meeting until that time. He was absolutely excited. And then they met for three hours. Mm -hmm. Three hours. We're talking about 1936. Mm -hmm. and Gandhi asked Reverend Thurman uh, detailed questions about slavery. Uh, mm -hmm. Was intermarriage by this time between uh, whites and African Americans, legal, was it being allowed? And, and, and uh, uh, Sue Bailey Thurman spoke about lynching. They had a very serious discussion. And at the end of three hours of conversation about the situation in the United States at that time and about the situation of India, which was still struggling for independence, mm -hmm. it was struggling for Hindu Muslim friendship, it was struggling for some equality for the for the Dalits, the untouchables of India. At the end of that three hour conversation, Gandhi said, and this was recorded at the time, both in India, and then when Howard Thurman returned to the US, he recorded it in the United States. Gandhi said, well, it may be that the African Americans will teach nonviolence to the whole world. Wow. In 1936. Mm -hmm. so this is what he said then. And, and this earlier this year when the Black Lives Matter thing happened and so much of America was out on the streets in a disciplined way, in a nonviolent way, fighting for equality, fighting for solidarity. I said to myself, once again, uh, Gandhi's incredible prophecy of the African Americans was, was being fulfilled. So I wanted to relate this story to you 
as a prelude, as the beginning of our, of our conversation. India, with 1.3 billion people, mm -hmm. which has tr tried to be a democracy for all these years after independence in 1947, almost 70 years uh, or more. So this country now is facing a very serious assault on our democracy. And some kind of uh, destruction of democratic rights, of human rights, of the notion of equality, uh, not yet a, a, a attempt to change the constitution, but an informal imposition of inequality. Uh, especially directed at the Muslims and the Christians who are a minority in India, and at the Dalits, uh, the former untouchables who are at the bottom of, of Indian society. If, as you say, as Howard Furman said, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, as Reverend James Lawson said to me just a few days ago, mm -hmm. that Gandhi gave something inspiring and useful to the African Americans at an important time in their life. I now make a request and appeal to you. Please do something for India now in return. We're coming and telling the first goal of always of moving towards speaking out in truth is to get the truth. And sometimes with the way in which the media is focused like a laser on just what's in this country, uh, we do not hear these larger truths, but we must, we must hear these larger truths and we must connect it um, to the rest of the world. Kinds of things happening in India where the very voices, the very religious voices, if you will, moral voices, end up choosing sides. And many times, too many of them choose the side of authoritarianism or the side of rugged, raw nationalism. And then, and, and there was this split. So, but it was 70 years of trying to be a democracy. And what did America also do that's very similar to this 70th year for India? America tried to build a democracy on an internal caste system to some degree. Mm -hmm. yes. Because see, it was in 1619 with Bacon, in the 1600s, it was at Bacon's rebellion that there was a decision to decide certain people were black. Race was not a category, but there was a deliberate decision and it grew out of when black and white people formed a coalition to fight against injustice, to fight against some, some uh, people who were trying to rule their lives. And the power structure said, we can't have this anymore. So we're gonna make certain people black and we're going to make a caste system called slavery. And that is how you're born is how you live. If you're born a slave, you're always a slave. And it was this caste system that was a that never really was dealt with when the democracy decided to call itself a democracy. So all of its founding words, and, and as Dr. King used to say, we have the high blood pressure of creeds and the anemia of deeds. And all of this, the high founding where we the people, uh, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It was built on top of this caste system of slavery. Yes. The words of the democracy, just like the words of the uh, Constitution of India, the Democratic Constitution of India, says one thing and calls for one thing. The legacy of Mahatma Gandhi calls for one thing, but then, but, then, but it's built on top of this system of caste, this system of untouchables. And, 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 and so, it, 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 so we need to have that conversation because in some ways, India in her 70th year or plus is in a very similar place, not exactly, not identical, but in a very similar place, some similarity than America was in her 70th year. And we didn't, it took a war to get, and we still haven't gotten it right, totally. No, uh, Gandhi was, convinced, he felt very deeply that India would embrace equality, embrace nonviolence, embrace love. Uh, India would be a nation for all. Uh, and it would, would fight for its freedom. Uh, but in 1934, a year and a half before the Thurman Gandhi meeting, 
two things happened. There were two attempts on Gandhi's life by mm -hmm. the by representatives of the higher caste Hindus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were angry with him for two reasons. That he wanted equality for Muslims along with Hindus. They didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the hierarchy, the high and low in Hindu society to end. So there were two attempts on, on Gandhi's life. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi also saw there was a pushback against the idea of everybody being equal and getting equal rights. And so uh, to some extent, Gandhi kind of saw that for India to embrace equality and non-violence, non-exploitation, non-hierarchy was, go was going to be a very tough challenge. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi has this insight that there is in the African-American spirit, the community, there is sacrifice, there is suffering, there is love of God, there is reaching out, there is searching, and Gandhi gets this inspiration which he shares that the African Americans may be the leaders of the world in this, in this new revolution. Mm -hmm. What it makes me think about is why maybe Thurman was so insistent on going to see Gandhi. Yes. And why Mahatma Gandhi was so drawn to Thurman from the standpoint of the two groups of people in this history. And what I mean by that is, if, if Gandhi was talking about love and bringing together the Muslim and the Hindu and justice and humanity, even before the civil rights movement, the basis of the struggle for freedom in this country by African Americans had primarily been nonviolent even in slavery. You know, Harriet Tubman stole slaves, she didn't kill slave masters. And poor white people, many of them who had been taught to hate black people, <clears throat> but during the Civil War, they came to see that ultimately injustice and slavery and authoritarianism was, would kill us all. And first would always kill the poorest because the slaveholders used the poorest whites to fight the war connection. Black, former slaves, free issue, and poor whites. They came together and they founded something called fusion politics. Mm -hmm. They came from different places, but they had a, a vision of what had to happen so that the nation could move forward. So if you will, the nation could have another birth, another founding. And they basically decided that freedom wasn't enough. You had to have full citizenship. And that full citizenship needed to be rooted in our deepest moral values, our deepest spiritual values. And that had to drive how we would reshape our constitutional values that what has to happen even today in America, and when I hear you mention what's going on in India, what has to happen in India, and what has to happen in every democracy that ever has been founded, but it didn't clean up some things at the very beginning, and that is reconstruction. But let me say this, that what you have said is so immediately relevant to India. These two ideas of fusion and reconstruction, mm -hmm. I think these are utterly necessary in today's India and, and of course in today's United States. I wanted to mention a couple of recent things about India. Last year, 2019, the present Indian government passed a law which uh, profoundly troubled everybody in India. And this law was like this, that India has many neighboring countries and the law said, that if refugees from these neighboring countries come to India and they want citizenship of India at some point, uh -huh. their, their path to citizenship will be simplified, will be made easier, provided they are Hindus uh -huh. or Sikhs or Christians or Jews or Buddhists but 
if they are Muslims, there will be no path to their citizenship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, religion was introduced as a criterion of citizenship. Mm -hmm. And there was a very great movement all across India. Over <coughs> and in the end, through an amazing nonviolent movement, somewhat similar, this happened in December of last year and January and February of this year, that there were marches on the streets of India in many, many cities, uh, like the marches we have seen this summer in the United States. And that is why in those very moments, it is the requirement, the faith requirement of those of us who know better and who know love and who know just, and can talk and can challenge those that are doing that without hating them. <laughs> You know, but understand that they've been captivated by, if you will, the spirit of authoritarianism. They've been, and and many times operating deep there. A lot of what we see in these Indian America is those that have held power. I believe in my heart, Brother Gandhi. A lot of it is, as the nations grow and as the people grow and as the demographics grow. The people who have kept the power, took the power, stole the power, held the power, benefited from the power, and done all kinds of things to people to do it, have a fear that the people that now are coming up are going to do the same thing to them <laughs> that they did to us. And that's not our intention. I apply it now. Whether you're in India or in America, I believe there are five interlocking injustices that are facing systemic racism and it plays itself out maybe one way in india one way here but it's still systemic racism right systemic poverty ecological devastation and denial of basic health care to people of the world the war economy where the economy of war drives so many decisions what uh and then the false moral narrative of religious nationalism those five interlocking injustices threaten the very soul and heart of the world. And I believe can only be challenged by movements that are rooted in deep love, deep justice, deep humanity, and movements that are willing never to choose killing to stop killing. <laughs> Even if it costs you and nonviolence in the world. And so maybe we need to make a pledge that says, okay, here's the deal. I'm gonna live the rest of my life like I might have only 48 hours of breath left. When I, 48 hours before I have to say, I can't breathe. And then I'm going to look at what is most important for me to use my breath doing. What, what's most, since I, I only have 48 hours at any time, that's a possibility, then I can't be wasting breath. I can't waste breath destroying people. I can't waste breath being quiet when I ought to be speaking up. I can't waste breath hating. I can't waste breath trying to kill people. I can't waste breath on religious nationalism. I can't waste it because I only got this 48 hour period possibly. And it's real clear now. And so what, I'm, what we're going to do is decide we're going to live like that, whether we live 48 more years or 48 more days or 48 more months, we're going to wake up every morning and say, I might don't, and, and, and the old folk and the slaves and the civil rights movement, they used to sing this, this might be my last time, this might be my last time, children, this might be my last time. Might be my last time, I don't know. Then they would say, so I'm going to fight on until my last time. Fight on until my last time, children. Fight on until my last time. It might be my last time, I don't know. And, and in our countries, those who are the remnant, we are both the remnant and the salvation. Injustice, uh, caste systems, injustice systems, systems rooted in hate, invariably have their own destruction already woven in it. You just can't hold it for so long. 
And ultimately, it's going to implode. It's going to fall in on itself. I mean, history has shown us that. Uh, if, if, it, if it wasn't so, all of the great nationalist authoritarian governments of ancient would still be existing. But all of them imploded. All of them. I hope, uh, Reverend Bob, that we will continue this and that we will find ways in which people of Indian origin, Indian Americans, other Asian Americans, African Americans, and white Americans, and everybody will fight on the basis of of what you have outlined. As I say to the young folk, you are nothing, you're not new. Don't, don't be so smart. Don't be so arrogant to think you're the first ones that have done this. You're not even the first ones that have come together black and white. It may be more on TV now, more people see it. But every moral movement has had diversity in this country and around the world. Yes. Sir. What, what you are is just, you all, all you are is in your time. It's your time now. And what you have to hope that in your time, with all of this, the things at your disposal, you do it a little bit better than those that did it in their time. Surita? Raju, you're up next. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Raju Rajagopal of Hindus for Human Rights. Uh, my task today is to bring to you some musical and video interludes uh, throughout the program that uh, goes along with our themes. And I would like to start with a uh, clip from uh, a Kabir movie, which uh, brings to our mind the work of Kabir, which is so relevant today. लड़की की लड़के की औरत की आदमी की ये 
जब तक दूर नहीं होगी नहीं तब तक सुमरण हम कर ही नहीं सकते ये बिल्कुल पक्की बात है संतों का कहना हम नहीं कह रहे मूल ये नहीं है कि हम हिंदू हैं कि हम मुसलमान हैं कि हम सिख दिन ईसाई पालते हैं मूल चीज वो है जिसकी वजह से आप और हम सब जिंदा हैं उसको पकड़ने की जरूरत है उसके साथ जुड़ने की जरूरत है तो जहाँ मूल से अलग हटे आप कहीं ना कहीं बंधवा को काम हो जा रहा है अनेक बंधन से बांध दिया एक बेचारा जीव और के बस बच्चे आपने और केस बता रहे जीव सदगुर कभी ना हमेशा बांधो को काम नहीं करे छोड़वा को काम करे परंतु हम तो कहीं कर मालूम मुंह इना खंबा से बंधी हो ये इना खंबा से बंधी है न मुंह इनके कुंभ के सब मारे छोड़े दो नहीं मारे के जैसे सब मारे छोड़े दो तो संभव नहीं बंदे को बंदा मिला ने छुटे कौन उपाय अरे कर बंद की निर्बंद की जो पल में लेगा छुड़ा है Thank you, Prahlad ji. Thank you, Shabnam Virmani. And thanks to Professor Linda Hess of Stanford for keeping the memories of Kabir alive in the US today. Uh, we now move on to the panel discussion number one. And uh, I would call on either Punya, if he's online, or Sunita to say a little bit about the panel discussion before we uh, play the video of it. Thank you. Hey, Raju, how are you today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Perfect. Thank you all very much, Pranams. Uh, good morning and good evening to everyone who's joining us today. Um, my name is Punya, Punya Pathyay, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present this panel on Hinduism and what it means for all of us. Uh, in some ways, this is a conversation that we're having among Hindus, and we can all see the limitations of some of the discussion we're having. Uh, I am speaking with uh, Professor Anantanand Rambachan, who is a renowned scholar and has really done some excellent work in the idea of engaged Advait, and Pandit Vishwambar Mishra, who is the Mahant of the Sankat Mochan Temple in Banaras, the most famous Hanuman temple where Tulsidas finished writing the Ramcharit Manas and saw Hanumanji manifest himself. Uh, he is also a professor at uh, ITBHU and teaches microelectronics. For me, I'm a academic. I have been a strategy consultant and I've spent the last 20 years doing seva at my guru's ashram here in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, the panel of course is limited. We are all men, all upper caste. And yet the discussion we're having on a creative and generous Hinduism is so important for our times that it was worth it to start the discussion and see how it'll unfold. So many of our friends and family believe that the only way to be a Hindu is to be angry and violent, to accept the agendas of those who distort our traditions, that Lord Siaram is not a God of love, but a God of war, although his war was only for a few days, and it's only a few pages in the whole of the Ramayana of the Ramcharit Manas, that Hanumanji is not first a singer, but is first a warrior and angry, that all our gods are gods of joy is what we believe and our gods and goddesses bring us ways to think about both the beauty in our tradition, as well as all the things we need to work on to heal, renew and replace and replenish so that we can all together reclaim India. Thank you so much for joining us.
we're very lucky to have uh, Mishra Ji and Ram Bachan Ji with us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Hinduism versus the ideas that some people have of Hindutva. And our discussion today is very lucky to have two such glorious personalities like Mishra Ji and Ram Bachan Ji with us. Mishra Ji, whom you can see on the screen, is a professor at ITBHU and has been one teaching microelectronics for a long time. And in the Indian tradition of having multiple hats and multiple personalities, uh, he is also the Mahant of one of my favorite temples and probably one of the most important Hanuman temples in the world, the Sankat Mochan Temple, where Tulsidas Ji himself manifested uh, Hanuman Ji many, many days ago. His family has been the Mahant there for over uh, 14 generations now, in the 14th generation, uh, Praji. And uh, they have a long history of uh, both uh, social, secular, and spiritual inquiry uh, that is going to be helping us and guiding us today. And we also have from the US, so Mishraji is coming to us from Badaris. And from the US, we have uh, Professor Anantran Rambachinji, who is originally from Trinidad and Tobago and has been teaching in the US for a long time. He has a very active uh, practice around a uh, very vital understanding of non-duality as a practice that is very alive and very uh, progressive and is a well-known, well-renowned teacher and author with multiple books, uh, really looking at an active liberation in the world and has, for example, hosted a BBC series that has been translated into multiple languages and spread out over 25 sessions. Uh, so he's been a teacher both at university and locally for a while, and we're very lucky to have both of you here with us today uh, to talk about this uh, important uh, topic and this important discussion. So there's a broader pattern, if you will, of Hinduism across thousands of years, where although we have such great uh, gifts and capabilities and wisdom, we also have a history of uh, mistakes and of sorrow, of pain. Uh, in very broad terms, I'd say that there is an issue around, if you will, caste. So I think that the first thing that I want to say on this is that we have to recognize that as, as Hindus, as human beings, we are flawed human beings. We are capable also, you know, we must not so idealize our community or our past to represent ourselves as perfect. We must acknowledge our capacity for inhumanity, our capacity for injustice, and our capacity also for oppression. We, we carry the guilt of that history as, as Hindus. So for, we must start by acknowledging what I say, you know, the humanity, the injustice, the oppression of this system, this hierarchical system. Um, and also, you know, whatever we, we might think about it, I'll, I'll try to come to that. We have to recognize also that it has been legitimized by certain interpretations of the Hindu tradition, by appealing to certain Hindu teachings and Hindu doctrines. So we, we have to recognize that. I say that because of something that troubles me a lot um, in, in, in contemporary discussions of caste, which is, the tendency to uh, apologetically um, explain away the, the system, this caste system, as a creation of foreign intervention. Mm. As though, you know, we had no caste system until we had um, these communities coming inside of India. And history does not support that, that argument. You know, we, we know that, you know, by 400 uh, CE, we had um, standard features of the system uh, in place. And we know we have to acknowledge also that in spite of, I mean, uh, of course, you know, India is a changing uh, nation and a lot of good things are also happening uh, in India. We have, we have legal um, frameworks in place. In spite of that, we, I think we also have to acknowledge that too many Hindus still, I'll put it this way, too many Hindus still define um, the meaning of Hindu identity over and against those who are considered to be of lesser and lower 
uh, who, that should not ever be a part of defining one's self-identity in, in relation to the diminished uh, value of the other. So we, we need to develop also uh, a discourse of self-criticism. We need to see caste as one historical expression of a system of human oppression and, and domination that sanctified itself in the garb of religious uh, validation. And we, as I said, you know, we are not exempt from the susceptibility to corruption of, of power and the tendency to value ourselves by devaluing others. Having said that, uh, Punyaji, I must say that, and this is where I take my stand on these matters of patriarchy or caste. So I must say that although caste has sought and continues to seek legitimacy by appeal on certain interpretations of the Hindu tradition, there is a theological vision at the very heart of the Hindu tradition that invalidates the assumptions of caste, and I would include patriarchy, the assumptions of inequality, impurity, indignity that are the, are the foundations of this system and, and nourished by this vision. You know, we have a chorus of prophetic voices, ancient and modern, protesting caste as a betrayal of the core spiritual vision of the Hindu um, tradition. Like, you know, we can think of so many examples, both from South, North, East, West, you know, Tiruvaluvar, Tirumalar, Basaveshwara, Ramananda, Kabir, Eknath, how many great teachers of the Hindu um, tradition there who have, who have stood for and spoken about the sisterhood and brotherhood of all human beings. And they, of course, um, you know, sometimes their impact has been limited to the religious sphere. Our challenge today is to disseminated to, uh, to the social sphere. To use this, this vision of human dignity to transform uh, and to, to, to work against uh, social um, uh, injustice. And you know, even right on to contemporary people, Narayana Guru, Arya Samaj founders, Swami Dayananda Saraswati, our late friend uh, Swami Agnivesh, you know, they were all important. Uh, voices, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I want to also remember him as part of our conversation as, as, a, as a great Hindu teacher who we recently um, lost, and who was a great supporter of the work of uh, progressive uh, Hindu uh, tradition. So this is we, we must be prepared, in other words, to acknowledge and not deny the truth of it but also to contest it from within our tradition on the basis of the rich and deep vision um, that we have of human dignity, human equality, human um, in, in inclusivity. As Ram said, I also quote, Purusha na pumsaka nariva. It's a very beautiful Uttar Khans. Purusha na pumsaka I cite this verse uh, because he speaks here about men and women, and he speaks also about people who belong to other genders. Purushana Pumsaka Nari Jeeva Chara Chara Jete. Whoever you are, living beings, you know, we can expand the category. Sarva Bhav Bhaja, you know, who, who celebrates and worships me in love. Kapata Taji, you know, renouncing a hypocrisy. Um, is dear to me. A very inclusive expression of divine love. And this is what our Hindu tradition is about. But today, unfortunately, we have made the Sri Ram, Sita Ram, the, the origin, the sustenance, the support of all creation into a small deity, a tribal deity, into a small God. This is our tragedy. And this is, uh, this is very unfortunate. And our obligation about what we can do, you know, we have to lift our voices and to speak from the heart of our Hindu tradition about a divine reality that is the, embraces every being. Uh, and in that embrace, every the, the words and value and dignity of every being 
is a firm. Sri Ram is not the god of Hindus. <laughs> Sri Ram is the god of all humanity. Let us not make Sri Ram into the god of, into a small god of a Hindu tribe. That, that is, and that would always be a great tragedy if we did that. One thing I've liked about Sankat Mocha, you know, about my Guru's ashram here, or one of my favorite temples in the world is Kedarnath, right? And uh, Shankar Suvan Kesari Nanda, that is one of Hanumanji's names, uh, is that there is an acceptance of everybody, right? There's a way in which people come together. And at the same time, there is the fact that there are people who choose to act bad. There are people who, you know, create violence. There's ongoing violence within the streets of India in the name of Sri Ram or, you know, there were people who were rioting in Delhi and they were chanting the Haruman Chalisa, which was very hard for me when I heard that. Uh, are there people who misuse this? How do you address these people who are misusing Hanumanji or misusing Ram or misusing Hinduism in general? You know, uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, see, one uh, term which uh, I think probably nobody is using, Yuga Dharma. Uh, mm. So sometimes it happens and this, these, these type of people are exposed in the society and society takes its, its own course. See, unless they do do this, they are not exposed. And mm. everybody knows what is the purpose of doing all these things. Everybody is aware of that. And I think this global society will teach them the lesson. And as uh, Ananta, Dr. Ananta Nanji has said, Ramji should not be contained in this small philosophy, the philosophy of your need. He is a global deity and his deity of the whole world. He is Parabrahma Parmeshwar and he is much above what we know and what we exercise in our day-to-day -day life. He is much above that. So it is beyond, uh, Bhagavan Ram is beyond our imagination. We should only accept. Parbas jiva sobas bhagavanta jiva anek ek shrikarta. We are parbas. We are parbas. But Bhagavan Ram is sobas. That is the difference. You must understand. We don't have a capability of doing all this nonsense. You must respect the creation of Bhagavan Ram. And I think that is the need of the time. And everybody should understand this. And I think this is enough. And this is a big message also. But I think part of the problem um, uh, today is this uh, identification of the Hindu tradition with, with nation. The, the relationship between religion and the rise of nationalism, where the, the tradition is now appropriated and limited to a certain definition of national identity. But even more than that today, it is the identification of the, the tradition with a particular party and a particular leadership. And so when we, and, and when that identity becomes so fused, so inseparable, then unfortunately what happens is that any criticism of political leadership is received or seen or perceived as a criticism of, of the religious tradition. But the proper role of the Hindu tradition as we affirm in, in Sardana and in Hindu for, Hindus for Human Rights is not to be the servant of the state. It's not to serve the state's interest. It's not to be seduced by the state, but to be the moral conscience of human beings is to be that moral conscience and to hold the state accountable. But many people don't want religion to play that role. They want a religion that is a servant of the state. And they hope sometimes that perhaps their religion will become the master of the state. In, a, in progressive Hinduism, we don't want to serve the state. We don't want to, to be the master of the state. We want to be the ethical voice, the compassionate ethical voice of human beings. And I think that is what our tradition asks of us. And that is where we must stand. This is beautiful. I, I want to thank both of you again for responding here because what I hear from you that as regular Hindus, as those of us who are walking and living and carry this beautiful tradition in our voices, one one theme I heard from you was, you know, Ananta Ananji to really talk about our ethical, our caring, our compassion. Um, and Mishraji, what part of what I heard from you was courage. You know, that we define ourselves. We don't get defined by anyone else. And this courage to be a good Hindu, to be a happy person, to be generous, to be compassionate, 
is in many ways what our work is. Our work is not to support anger, not to support greed. It is not to support buildings or things or states or parties. It really is to support humanity, to acknowledge who we have been and then to come forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Punya. Uh, and uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, I just want to say here that all of these pre-recorded panels will be available for full viewing in the next few days. Uh, we'll post the details on the Reclaiming India website. And as uh, Punya observed, there's a lot of internal dialogue and discussion that needs to take place among Hindus in our families. And uh, this dialogue is, uh, is part of that internal conversation that all of us in our own ways need to have. Uh, we move on to the next uh, musical interlude. Yesterday was Gandhiji's birthday. And from what I understood, Vaishnava Janato was one of his favorite songs. And here performing Vaishnava Janato under the guidance of T.M. Krishna, who is also an advisory member of Hindus for Human Rights, he is a Chennai children's choir coming from marginalized families in Chennai. So let's start with that. Kapil? the Chennai Children's Choir. Yes, sure.
Thank you. Thank you to TM Krishna. Thank you to the Chennai Children's Choir. And uh, thank you to Nalanda Wai Foundation. Uh, I would like to next pass the baton to the panel discussion number two. And I call on Dr. Murli Natarajan to take it from here. Well, thank you so much, um, Raju. Um, the following conversation between, uh, between Martin McQuan, uh, Professor Jabroja Singh and me today is a small glimpse into a much longer and ongoing conversation that has been happening in different nooks and corners of our own selves and society, and one that needs to continue long after we have left. But to me, um, it is a story about why and how Dalit lives matter, uh, how Dalit lives ought to matter, but do not in fact in our casteist, patriarchal, exploitative society, about how caste conscious, not caste blind, but caste conscious anti-casteism looks like, about reclaiming dignity and humanity of Dalits for the liberation of all, and also about how dominant caste group members need to place our stakes very clearly in order to be a genuine part of this struggle. So let's get into the conversation. Thank you so much to the organizers. my honor and privilege to be able to be in conversation with two comrades whose lives and social relations embody what they are fighting for. Martin McQuan needs very little introduction for anyone who has followed the struggles of Dalits in India. In his more than four decades of work, Martin has worked at the local level, for example, building his organization Navsarjan in the wake of the Golana killings of Dalits in Gujarat an organization that battles for Dalit land rights, along with Adivasi rights, uh, to the national level as the convener of the national campaign on Dalit human rights, and also at the international level, where he spearheaded the civil society demands to view caste as a human rights violation at the UN conference at Durban. Martin has won several international awards that have recognized his valuable and unstinting work for social justice, um, most importantly, Martin is a joy to meet, to chat, and to learn from, a trait that I believe is grounded by his firm moral compass. Dr. Roja Singh is a dear comrade and colleague, another prominent figure in diasporic and transnational progressive politics and Dalit struggle. Roja is visiting pro assistant professor at St. John Fisher College and works on the intersections of caste, gender, class, and religion. She has also had a long engagement with education and struggles for dignity in India, being the co-founder of the Thai Educational Hostel for Dalit Girls in Pudukote, India, and also president of the Dalit Solidarity Forum in the US. Apart from her various writings on caste, class, and gender, Roja's work on oral narratives and cultural expressions of Dalit communities of women in South India and other indigenous communities has resulted in a very well-received book, Spotted Goddesses, Dalit Women's Agency Narratives on Caste and Gender Violence. I'm Dr. Balmurim Natrajan, an anthropologist and engineer by training who has worked on issues of casteism, labor and culture in India. I teach at William Patterson University a working class public university in New Jersey, and take seriously what the radical black educator, Dr. Patina Love names as co-conspiratorial work. So to get this panel underway, our panel, as has been mentioned, is titled hashtag Dalit Lives Matter. 
It's a theme that sits at the heart of the conference's main theme of reclaiming, reclaiming India in this case. So let us begin, therefore, by hearing from both of you about the title of the conference, Reclaiming India. Reclaiming is, of course, an idiom of resistance to Hindutva, a Brahminical, supremacist, and ultranationalist force that is now clearly fascistic and in control of India. So from your vantage points, as activist intellectuals who have shaped Dalit demands for several decades, what is in need of reclaiming by Dalits? What has been lost by Dalits, in other words? What has been taken away from Dalits? And most importantly, also by whom? And over the course of a long history of oppressions, exploitations, and humiliations. Um, I first of all want to acknowledge that I am sitting on the traditional land of the Sanaka Nation, the keepers of the Western Door, the original peoples of the Five Nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I acknowledge the Seneca community, their elders, both past, present, and future generations. And we acknowledge that many of our institu institutions were founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on this land where I'm sitting right now. And I want to acknowledge my ancestral lands of Sogandi in Tamil Nadu and Chengalpattu district in Tamil Nadu as well. So what was lost? Um, I think for me, in my perspective, not I think, I believe strongly, we need to go back to talking about the whole idea of humanity and personhood. So that stands out at most for me in every conversation that I have and every action that I'm involved in and every piece of writing for me, the centrality of what was lost was personhood. And once you take that away from somebody, that just causes intergenerational trauma that we see today after thousands of years of endorsing such graded inequality as divinely sanctioned and lodging it into narratives that had potential that was already proven as oral tradition, right? So when there are dominant narratives that kind of stamps it as your brand that you are not a human being, then where do you go from there, right? So when, once that is denied, then all else is denied for you. Well, I can say that uh, we're talking about India. So from uh, many, many years before independence, there was a struggle to reclaim the humanity. There was judicial prohibition on Dalits to learn. Severe punishment was inflicted for attempts to learn. You had no right to walk on the roads. There were rules as to how many meters you must walk from others so that your shadow also does not fall. There were no political rights. And the only hope was that if we become independent from the British, then you will become like citizens. So many people, including Jyotiba Fule, and then lastly, Dr. Bhimra Ambedkar, he fought on both accounts, on the political independence, not for only Dalits, but for the whole India, and also for Dalits, so that they're treated as human beings. So 1947, India became independent. 1950, we had the constitution, which for the first time criminalized practices of untouchability. That's closely seven and a half decades earlier. Today, I am coming to from a state, Gujarat, not unknown to US uh, uh, people staying in the US from India. Both the Prime Minister and uh, the Home Minister are from this state. So was Gandhi earlier. And it's considered, considered to be the model state. And we did a study on untouchability practices in 2010. It says that though Dalis are Hindus, 
in 90.2% villages they cannot enter temples in 64% government schools dalits are seated separately during the midday meal in 54% of the villages dalits who may be elected in the local self government but they will not be allowed to sit on the chair and the water pots will be separate so you have the two parallel rules going on in india at the same time the rule of the constitution and the rule of the caste we had hoped that the rule of the caste will land in 1947 unfortunately all the political parties that we have today consciously they tried to provoke and propagate caste as a valid social political system india cannot it looks like today it cannot be reclaimed unless it liberates itself from the clutches of the caste system that's what i would say but thank you so much uh, both martin and roja uh, powerful indictments of the very state of our being and always a good place to begin with acknowledgement of the rot that has very deep roots so i um, welcome this and i want your words to ring loud and clear and travel wide and hit deep so let's let's actually continue with that and um, move directly to the question of equality and citizenship and of course manuski or humanity what ambedkar called in marathi uh, and in his famous resignation speech uh, that ambedkar made almost to this date uh, 69 years ago on september 27th 1951 outside the legislative assembly dr ambedkar made the following remark and i quote to leave inequality between class and class between sex and sex which is the soul of hindu society untouched and to go on passing legislation relating to economic problems is to make a farce of our constitution and to build a palace on a dung heap and quote um those are not just memorable words but they need to be a constant reminder about where we are headed and what we need to do so ambedkar was of course referring to the hindu code bill and how the votaries of hindutva at that time violently opposed it we are today i would say in a much worse situation with all the inequalities social and cultural all those inequalities intact or even worsened for example the anti atrocity act has been diluted even more uh, but also many of the economic legislations that were put into place um, in the early days of the republic to protect workers and the precariat uh, and a bulk of them are dalits and adivasis and muslims um, those are also being dismantled very systematically as with other draconian laws being passed so what then is the reality of dalits under the hindutva regime what are the possibilities for liberation uh, is it for example education is it conversion is it policy changes and the law social movements of course all of these or something else and a combination of any of these i know this is a big question but i do want us to actually talk freely about this um yeah thank you morley for leading us into this um thought right now because for me looking at what ambedkar stood for what he stands for right now um in his language he does use social dalit social consciousness about rekindling and reclaiming our humanity reclaiming equality and he was about education as well right so i want to go back to where i started from because 
my comments are going to be centered around this dichotomy of humanized, dehumanized, right? So whose side are we on? And Ambedkar was very clear that you cannot be on both sides. You either are with, you're either like, you know, <laughs> in hell or in heaven kind of a situation for him. So I think we cannot be both. And if we are, then he points out that there is a personal dysfunction, right? It, and a collective dysfunction as a culture, so which can only be treated if it's acknowledged and accepted as yes, we are starting from the premise of a civilization that was founded on inequality. And unfortunately, right, it was lodged into scriptural narrative, so therefore nobody could question it. And so we have clear evidence of language that dehumanizes um, Dalits and others um, in right in the stories that have been passed down to us so so that permanence was ensured to us in the storytelling and we know the power of storytelling once inequality is established in a story that is based and rooted in religious tradition you cannot erase it and and i think that's what adichi talks about also the danger of a single story and nobody has dared to change that story so when Dalits are stepping up to say, we want to change that story, you know, we are demonized in the scriptures and the dominant narratives as the other, right? So we want to change the story. And when we step up to release our own language and words to change the story, then we need to be punished, right? So that's the punishment tradition that has been continuing because of this graded inequality institutionally sanctioned by dominant narratives. So, I mean, permanence was just so skillfully and so sophisticatedly done in terms of taking oral narratives, giving it written form, and making sure that it is sort of really engraved on stones where it is indestructible. So it was intentionally sort of, you know, sought after for permanence of these stories. So who dares change the story, right? I mean, if you're from Tamil Nadu, you're probably familiar with the story of the the old lady who you know who sells the vada and then the crow comes and takes the vada and then the fox comes and says oh crow you're so beautiful sing for me and the crow sings and the vada drops the fox runs away with the with the vada but somebody decided to change the story and say well the crow decided that it was not going to be fooled and so it put the vada under its leg and sang right so that's subversion right Lovely. so that's subaltern power and somebody decided to change the story. And that's the story I told my kids when they were growing up, you know. Kaka vade tukit poche, ana nari pola vade, you know. So that's important for us. Somebody has to change the story. And so for Ambedkar, you know, he challenged the Congress party. He says, I make only one condition. He says, tell me what I share, um, where I am to have in the Swaraj. If you don't want to tell me that, you want to make up with the British behind my back. He says, hell on both of you. You know, so he did not mince his words at all when it came to claiming inequality and pointing out the fact that Brahminical elites were cohort with, you know, with the British elite as well. So, yeah, so he points that out um, in such, you know, uh, stark and uh, poisonous language, actually. <laughs> So, um, so unfortunately, that's what we still seeing today, as Martin pointed out, in the school systems and the health, um, you know, care set up, um, in you know, in political institutions, you still see, you know, underrepresentation and Dalit children being shunned, right, being shunned, still as being treated as inhuman. So, so we're still fighting that inequality between. So much, Roja. Martin? Yeah, I uh, see there is a fundamental problem. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Ambedkar had uh, understood it very well. Unfortunately, we, today we don't understand it. And so under the, under the scriptures, under Hinduism, what is upheld to be the ideal is the one who claims that I am the highest one, right? Now that's a problematic thing because to my understanding, where there is no equality, there cannot be any religion. So they themselves under the scriptures say that Hindus 
are basically unequal. So there's Brahmin at the top and the Kshatriya down and within the Brahmin there are uh, 40 kinds of people and you know 6,000 uh, conglomeration of 6,000 small caste here and there. So people who themselves do not have the religion to expect that they can help me to reclaim my dignity is absolutely impossible. And therefore, I think that's what Dr. Ambedkar also said, is post-independence. It is not your so-called dharma which is going to liberate you. It is the constitution because the society must be governed by the law. That's why is the law for the first time which says that all are equal. Otherwise, for 3,000 years, there's the only thing, a written word, saying basically people are unequal. So, the reclamation, as Buddha says, will have to start from the self. I have to reject that very ideology which is enslaving me, it has enslaved my generations. And believe that I'm equal. I'm not lower than anyone, I'm not above anyone. And that led me to define who a Dalit is. And I say, I, I, I teach others. Dalits are those who believe in equality. Dalits are those who practice equality. And Dalits are those who protest inequality. So today we are all talking about India to be transformed into a Hindu Rashtra. What does that mean? It means the imposition of the caste rule to marginalize the constitution. And this is the struggle which is there today. So Roja rightly says that my believing is not sufficient in themselves. I have to create literature. I have to write books for children. I have to change my songs. I have to change my language. Because it is through socialization and through the language that this value of inequality is continued from generation to generation. I mean, I was just reading something yesterday which came up uh, the National Crime Records Bureau in India, they came out with uh, the numbers of people who commit suicide. About 2,66,000 plus people have committed suicide in India during 2019. But what is important further to for us that 66.6% .6 of these people who committed suicide their income was below 100,000 rupees per year. And 24% of these people are the people who, who are daily wage earners. So you have a religion saying we are all Hindus, but somebody has multi-billion uh, beyond imagination kind of resources. And somebody is forced to commit suicide because they have no food. There is something fundamentally wrong with the religion or any religion which cannot address the question of inequality. So whether it is socialization, whether it is our own education, our pedagogy of how to teach our children, all requires to change.
and to me that is a new religion thank, thank you. you thank you thank you both so much thank you murli thank you martin thank you dr roja singh uh, if you really want to see this fascinating conversation please look forward to a schedule when you can hear them all in full and i'm reminding you again to look at reclaimingindia.org for the schedule uh, we want to move on to the next interlude which is a group of dalit drummers from tamil nadu as you know drumming has been a traditional uh, occupation for the dalit community mostly confined to funerals historically there is a movement in tamil nadu to bring this art into a legitimate place in the society to be celebrated as an art form and there are many groups in tamil nadu coming out with these kinds of groups here is one example this is satya gramiya ishai kuru from satyanagar near tirupur here it goes
thank you thank you when i spoke to this group a couple of nights ago to seek their permission to share it with you they wanted me to pass on one request to you all uh, because of covid they are not able to perform anymore at weddings and other functions on the other hand also because of covid they cannot earn a living due to in their uh, historical performing in funerals and so forth so they just wanted me to let you all know in giving this permission that they're being hit from both sides today with that let me then pass you on to the next panel discussion number 3 this is a live discussion an exciting one that i'm particularly looking forward to so i'll hand the baton over to Soam and Debelina from Jipa to take it from here. Uh, hi everyone, uh, it's a good morning uh, in US and good morning to uh, in India. This is Soma Ditya from Global Indian Progressive Alliance. Our next discussion is on imagining a progressive India through the eyes of female youth leaders. We have young activist and law student of Delhi University, Swati Khanna. we have comrade oishi ghosh uh, president jawaharlal nehru university student union and a student leader of student federation of india comrade dipshita dhar a student activist and research scholar from jawaharlal nehru university yeah. and joint secretary of uh, student federation of india we have dr deblina moitra from global indian progressive alliance to moderate the panel with me over to deblina Hi so this is Devalina I will be co-hosting the panel and this is such an important topic like you know imagining progressive india through the eyes of uh, female youth leaders so i'm really glad to welcome you three and at the same time um in terms of like you know recent event so this panel becomes so important so we will talk about lot of topics and one of the topics would be women's safety obviously and that's what i'm wearing the mask so um we can start our discussion if all the panelists are here So um, I'm I'm not able to see all of the panelists here. Um, are you all here? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Nice to... Okay. 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 and you could answer whatever way you choose like you know the sequence so given how the recent you know actions of the government the uh, affect the future of india for example like privatization of railways minus 24% of gdp unemployment then you know conducting exam during uh, the covid situation so you know do you see an uprising among the youth and you know how do you um, lack the Live like you know apathy from the government. What are your message to the Indian youth in terms of you know changing the situation? Um, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, hi, I am Swati. I am from Delhi University. Uh, I think the way you said that there's a lack of apathy by the government on specific issues, pertinent issues of this country. I believe that we have to shift our narrative from. politics of emotions to politics of justice and equality constitutionalism and the main pertinent issues of this country should not be criminalism or casteism or sexism for that matter it should be employment the farmers issue the dalits issue the students issue and when we shift our narrative and in fact our own priorities to these things the government or the ruling party or the opposition party also changed their narratives in that way so i feel that we have to also cultivate this mindset in the youth in our generation that ultimately it is constitution which gives you the rights and it is economy which lets you have food and water it is uh, assimilation and togetherness which makes you one which we also call vasudev kutumbakam and that is how we can even you know push the government or the political parties towards these various issues that is how we can connect with them
Sure, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Oishi and Dipshita, like, you know, you can go in any order you like to, so. Um. Uh, hi, uh, this is Dipshita. I think the uh, thing is that I am traveling right now because as you know, uh, what's what you was also telling, the kind of gruesome rape and murder that uh, we have seen a few days back. So against that, there had been protests uh, which has been organized across the country. And since I am also the girls' convener, or I, I look after the girls' subcommittee of SFI, we are organizing different programs across the country, across the state. So right now I'm traveling. So if uh, at all you can, if I can speak and maybe I can wind up first and uh, then can go because I'm not sure how long we are going to have a stable network because we are going to the rural part of West Bengal. I think that would be the best thing. Yeah, please go ahead, Dipshita. Shall I start? Yeah, please, yes, please. do. Okay. Um, I think uh, there are, uh, as Swati was also telling that, uh, and I think also the other, I was just listening to the previous panel. Uh, the thing is that whatever we are witnessing in India today, we cannot see anything in isolation. It is true that, that there is a concentrated attack on the people of the Dalit and minority community. It is true there is a concentrated attack on the whole education system. Along with that, we have seen uh, during the pandemic, using the pandemic as an opportunity. Uh, this government has come up with three basic laws inside the parliament, which many of the time were passed without uh, following any of the democratic uh, decorum. Uh, there was no, there was no uh, discussion with the state governments. There was no discussion in the parliament. There was no proper debate and discussion on all the uh, laws which have been passed in the last three months. Uh, the first law that has come was the labor law dilution. That we have seen that basic things, I mean, though even the previous labor law which was in place, uh, that was not functioning. People are not implementing it and there was no check, uh, there was no surveillance uh, from the government side. And uh, even then, whatever we had in paper, whatever legality was there, we saw first that the government has come up with a position saying that even we are going to dilute that law. So the basic thing like eight hour of uh, working hour, the basic thing of that you have to be paid when you are doing overwork, uh, maternity leave, all those basic things which were uh, achieved by the working class after such a long period of uh, struggle was taken away. We saw after that uh, this new education policy that has come, new education policy 2020, that has come after almost 34 years. And that is actually helping, that is actually promoting the commercialization of education, the communalization of education, and also the corporatization of education. Then we saw there come environmental impact assessment bill, which was giving the free license to the corporate and the rich people of this country to loot the natural resources of India without uh, going through any of the uh, basic uh, you know, process that they had to go earlier to ensure that there is no environmental consequences of their action. And the last nail of what this government is trying to put on India's uh, people at large is the, as the agro bill uh, is, is, a, is a reform where they're saying that now the government is not going to intervene at all how the market and the farmers are interacting. Earlier, there were strict laws on uh, the limit or the permissible limit of how much uh, thing you can hoard in one place, how much you can put in your cold storage, the minimum support price, all these basic things were taken down. And if you're going to see all this law in a single straight, you will see there is one tendency which is very prominent in this government, and that is the withdrawal of state. Uh, from, a, from a perspective of a welfare state, where we think that a state's primary thing will be giving services, providing uh, peace minimum services of its citizen, uh, like the education, like the health, uh, like employment, all those responsibilities are now given away. The government is coming and telling that this state is not going to take care of the citizen. So if you're, a, if you're someone who has money, you can survive. If you're someone who doesn't have money, if you're someone who comes from the backward community, if you're someone who is often socially or economically, this government is not going to do anything proactive. And this withdrawal of state, this backtracking of state is something uh, which I think all of us should be very fearful of. We as Indians are scared about how India from a Nehruvian socialism uh, which actually thought that, that, that the state is going to take care, the state is going to be responsible for the well-being of its citizen, is now coming and telling that the, the government or the state is no more responsible. And the second thing which, uh, which we are also observing or which we are also scared of 
uh, we, we, we started telling this much before that uh, there is fascistic tendencies, there are autocratic tendencies. How we have seen Hitler used the parliament, uh, Hitler used the democratically elected places, spaces to curtail down the basic institution of democracy. The similar kind of thing is done in India right now. Uh, we are seeing how the Modi government is using the parliament where even the elected um, MPs are not given uh, the, the, the chance to speak. We have seen people who are protesting against the agriculture bill. Many of them are suspended. Uh, many of them were told that uh, if you are going to speak against the government, you are not going to allow that. Even when the agro bill was passed, it was passed like a voice vote, not not a proper electoral mechanism was also followed. So these are these are all uh, these signs that we are thinking that this country, which is supposed to be a democratic country, is slowly turning into a fascistic, uh, autocratic regime. The third and most important thing. Uh, as we know that when BJP started off, they had a very clear agenda. And that agenda was a communal agenda. That agenda was of Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. We have seen that when the RSS Pracharaks, let it be Goldworker, let it be Savarkar, let it be Hedgarvar, when they were speaking about what their Hindutva is going to be, uh, they have made it very clear that it's not about the religion to be precise. It's not about Hinduism or the moral or ethos of the Hinduism, which uh, people try to usually, you know, propose or propagate. It's about politics. They said that we want to use this identity of being Hindu to create a society, to uh, create a community, to create a state, to be precise, which can be ruled and which can be governed into a certain principle. And whatever we are seeing today, the way they are trying to construct are something which is called Hindu Rashtra, we are uh, seeing that how the rights of minority are taken down. We are seeing how uh, uh, such an old masjid has been demolished. In 1992, it was done. Uh, there had been a long legal battle, which had a very sad death uh, last day when the uh, the Supreme Court came and said that no one actually broke the Babri Masjid, where the people who broke it, let it be Lal Krishna Advani, let it be Uma Bharti, they came out and said that we are very proud. We've taken down that. Uh, one Babarka Masjid, we taken down this one sign of imperialism, of the Muslim imperialism that India had. So it's, it's a very uh, tricky, it's a very uh, sad situation. When the culprits are coming and saying that, yes, we have done something, and the Supreme Court is saying, no, we have not seen anything, we, we have closed our eyes. So this, uh, the, the, whatever has happened during the Babri Masjid demolition, afterwards, how uh, the Ram Mandir was constructed, how the statesman, let it be the prime minister, let it be the chief minister, being the uh, highest position of the respective state that they govern, how they intervene and how they be part of this whole uh, drama. We believe that somehow that basic ethos of the Indian constitution of being a secular democratic country is being uh, highly threatened. And this government, the RSS, BJP together, using the state machinery, using the democratically elected powers that they have through the parliament, they are basically uh, trying to deconstruct uh, this country, which was made with the principle of equity and justice uh, and fraternity by Baba Sahib Ambedkar, and slowly and very firmly trying to turn it into a Hindu Rashtra, where uh, Manuvad is going to work, where the upper caste are going to speak, and the people in the lower caste, the people in the working caste, the people in the of the, of the downtrodden and oppressed community, they are here to be born, they are here to be killed, they are here to be raped. Uh, you know what happened in Uttar Pradesh, how a Dalit woman was gang raped and the amount of brutality that was in her body is unimaginable. And the and the, the gruesome thing is, it's not only that, that murder and the rape that has happened, but how the state police took the body and burned it down without following any proper uh, procedure, how we see that mother, her mother, crying in front of the ambulance, telling that just give us some time to mourn. Give her just some time to cry. Don't take my uh, daughter away. And how you see uh, there's 144 in, uh, imposed there. Nobody can enter it. But at the same time, uh, the upper caste uh, parishad, the upper caste panchayats are happening. And they are saying that we are going to fight for our betas. We are going to fight for our son, our upper caste son, our archput son. We believe they cannot do anything wrong because at the end of the day, we are the ruling caste. We have the right given by the scriptures to rape women who are coming from lower caste and lower ca class. We have the right to kill people who we believe that we are born to rule. Uh, so whatever we are assuming, whatever we are fearing, all those fears are coming true. And whatever we are seeing in Uttar Pradesh today is just a trailer. It's just a trailer that what Modi, what BJP or the what RSS uh, dream 
of turning our India into. And I think that's exactly where uh, us, uh, all of us who believe in a democratic country, in a secular country, a country which is regulated and governed with constitution, uh, it is our responsibility to resist it. I think uh, all across the country, people are on the streets. The farmers had uh, led the way, uh, not only now, but when the Kisan march happened, we have uh, seen how the... Dipshita, uh, sorry, yeah. we have to interrupt a little bit because yeah. um, it's like uh, for the interest of the time because there are two other panelists. So I... I'm just ending. This is my... Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. No, this is my last line. Yeah. So I think uh, the working class, the working class of this country has showed us the way. And now uh, throughout the country, people are coming down the, the streets. They're demanding for justice. They're demanding for all those things which are promised in the, our constitution. And I think uh, in this struggle, uh, in this, this uh, unity of struggle, all of us are going to stand together, shoulder to shoulder. And that should be the spirit of our uh, conversation today. Thank you. And I'm really, really terribly sorry, first of all, for taking a lot of time. And secondly, no, you, for, you can all understand. Thank you so much. Thank you. So do you, would you please stay for the panel or how does it work for you? Because I, I remember at the sorry? beginning you said that, you know, I said like, would you stay for the panel or how does it work for you? I know you were traveling. Yeah, so I, could you please stay or? Okay. Yeah, no, I could listen. I could listen to whatever the other panelists were uh, saying, but because I had to take uh, uh, care of my data, so I turned my camera off. Now also I'll be in the panel, but maybe not uh, with my video. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for the answer. It was really Thank insightful. You. And I'm sorry that I have to interject. No, so it's, Oishi, it's, <laughs> it's fine. Oishi, would you please answer the question about the, you know, youth uprising? Like, what do you think about that? And how can you change the, you know, the mentality of the youth and how government is so apathetic towards the uh, entire situation? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Dipshita and uh, Swati, I think so, elaborately has said what's happening in our country. Uh, we know it's a very difficult situation. Whoever is speaking up in the country at this moment uh, are either being uh, falsely implicated through uh, laws like UAPA and they are being put behind the bars. We have seen in the last uh, few months, especially during the time of pandemic, uh, when the worldwide we are facing a pandemic, we are trying to uh, manage a health crisis. We have seen that how you uh -huh. and activists uh, who have been very vocal uh, about uh, the BJP and the RSS's anti-people policy have been put behind behind the bars, whether it's journalists. Uh, recently in this Hatras case also, we are seeing uh, the journalist who actually first went uh, and investigated the whole situation and now been falsely implicated into several uh, false uh, news and everything. So the matter at this moment is the youth, uh, again, as we come back, has to understand that uh, we have a history. We have a history where we have seen that how the uh, uh, imperial, uh, imperialism has worked uh, in our country so strongly and uh, how the Britishers have uh, colonized our country. And what uh, we are seeing at this moment is a new form of imperialism. Uh, which is invisible. People are not trying to understand by the corporates, by this BJP and the RSS, uh, who are trying to capture everything. Uh, they are cap trying to capture the structure. Uh, they are trying to uh, twist and turn uh, whatever laws we have, whatever uh, we have, have been written in the constitution. What the youth at this moment has to uh, understand and need to be upfront about is that uh, what has the constitution said or given to us that Baba Sahib Ambedkar has given to us. Uh, so, and once we are clear about it, that what on nine, uh, in 1947, what was the uh, country's uh, major ideals were, we will be clear for what we are fighting ahead and what is our goal. Uh, that will be clear in front of us. Uh, so the youth has to understand that the country was supposed to be built on a scientific temperament. It is supposed to be secular, democratic uh, in nature. But at this present moment that we are seeing that uh, the democratic ideals of this country has been broken into pieces by the uh, ruling dispensation. They are trying their every bit uh, to ensure that there is a fear there, uh, that there are uh, academic spaces which have been uh, broken down. Uh, there are... Uh, spaces where they are just trying to uh, make sure that there are uh, communities which are fighting uh, on the basis of caste or religion. Uh, they are wanting the youth uh, to remain un un unemployed. Like India has seen highest uh, unemployment uh, rate in the, last, uh, uh, in the last few years. So the things that are happening, the youth, uh, what uh, Swati uh, said also before, that I totally agree that the youth should understand that there are certain priorities that we have. It's our education, it's, our, it's the job, uh, it's the farmer's voices that has to be heard. 
and that is exactly why we elect a government which has to look after its people but what we see contrary at this moment in this country uh, is the government is only looking after the corporates uh, their taxes are even uh, done like uh, tax uh, the payments are been done free but on the other hand a farmer is uh, is trying to kill uh, himself uh, or a farmer's whole family is trying to kill themselves because they are not able to repay loans so this is a very uh, pathetic situation in our country where people of this country uh, are not been heard to people of this country who feed our country people uh, who like farmers uh, the marginalized uh, section the communities the working uh, community which has made this uh, country brick by brick they have put their sweat their labor their blood into making this country is now uh, been thrown own away uh, are not uh, their issues are not been highlighted and every anti people policy and pro corporate policies are been brought into so the youth has to be very mindful but along with it uh, we have to read and read more about whatever is happening around us and try to uh, tell uh, each other try to organize uh, more and more youth that what is happening today has a longer consequence in the coming days and if this continues uh, then there will be nothing bit of what we uh, like dream of calling india to be a democratic secular nation would be left into it sure so uh, you already like you know said the background for the next question so you know the arresting of all the political dissenters and silencing the constitution keepers bypassing the parliamentary procedures privatization of everything so you know where do you see india going in next 10 20 years because you are the hope for all of us and uh, how do you see it going you both like you know if you can answer first then we can go to swati I uh i i mm, the sound is a bit is it muffled um swati did you hear my question yeah okay please go ahead then so in next 10 to 20 years we can be hopeful and hopeless as well because i think that uh, seeing looking at the situation like dipsha also said there i she also said there are priorities and the institutionalized institutionalization of Commun communal caste politics all these things and the normalization the way we are not even be, uh, realizing that in a democratic country this has been normalized to a fact that we are not understanding that even we, when we take an example of north korea that's also a workers party but it's ultimately north korea right it's called a workers party but it has been so normalized we are there are truths then there are narratives so if we are put in narratives we will not be able to ever find a solution or come to a consensus because there will be a narrative whether it's bjp congress whether it's caste narrative or a uh, communal narrative we have to come out of this narrative to go for truth and similarly when dr ambedkar said that when we make a constitution it has to protect the minorities rights the socio economic uh, underprivileged classes rights and if it's rendered useless then what is the use of this constitution now using the name of the constitution using the name of democracy if you do exactly the opposite then it becomes normalized they said that the justice will be served to the hatras victim but justice leave justice the hatras victim didn't even the parents didn't even get the right to even cremate their daughter with customs and traditions they wanted to how will they accept the fact that their daughter, their daughter has left the world and now you are uh, putting police across the up delhi border that you will not be able to enter and it has been so normalized that people are proving if it was a rape or not and this is not the first time it is happening it happened in kathua rape case it happened in uh, kuldeep singer's case when we were being more complacent and in living in denial and that is where i see that the youth has to understand that don't get into this narrative if you have also read that study a documentary has come social dilemma the narrative comes right. in our faces when we are on the phones the narrative comes in our faces so we yeah. have to read newspapers understand the things we just don't have to say that okay farmers are brainwashed students are brainwashed dalits are brainwashed whoever is dissenting is brainwashed we cannot say that because the people know their rights they're claiming their rights and now coming in 10 to 12 years or 10 to 20 years 
we always see that every dissent or every movement starts from a peasant, it is a peasant movement or it's a student movement uh, and similarly when you see the farmers protesting day in and day out you have to we have to be empathetic to the farmers when we become a society which is sadistic we are not able to even empathize with what they are going through we we just get into this tech technicalities that oh msp is technical msp is technically not harmed why are the farmers protesting in law also if you don't write something it doesn't mean that is the literal meaning of the act if msp is technically not being harmed but you are giving the private players the right to procure and store without any limitation how will you make sure that they will not exploit the farmers below the msp which is price flooring in economics terms we say this is the minimum the minimum which is the cost of the crop a farmer must get similarly when we went for ca protesting we there was a narrative that it is for refugees it was today the ca is the law of the land we not we cannot even help the hindus or sikhs applying ca because it has a deadline of 2014 leave the exclude excluding part that they have not included the muslims but they cannot even help them the six in afghans the rohingyas the uighurs the tamils how will you accept them when you have made a deadline of 31st december 2014 but the narrative says that no minorities are being helped that is how when i was talking about it that it is arbitrariness when uh, i i she said that no uh, there's a narrative and there are uapa whenever you dissent uapa is food sedition is food we have to go we are a progressive society if we want to be a progressive society we have to in fact dilute this these british laws of sedition we but we are coming with uapa another horrendous law more than more horrendous than rolled act so wherein jail is a norm and bail is an exception however in our indian law bail should be a norm and jail should be an exception so and questioning the courts questioning these laws no hearings of these laws for example ca has been questioned abrogation of 370 has been questioned the judicial review of uapa everything has been questioned but you cannot see the hearings happening the hearings are happening of kamuna or not or some bollywood actors or actresses which is not relevant for our country right now so the youth has to be shifted towards it i am not i don't i don't really want to scare the youth oh we are going down the drain we can if we are not vigilant enough so if we become vigilant enough we will understand that we can save the country and it is not the first time it is happening we will be in denial if we say that we it is uh, happening for the first time because even in emergency time it, these things were institutionalized the institutional invasion was done by that government also in 1975 in the in the gandhi government and that is why i quote bhagat saying that my strength is this my strength is the strength of the oppressed and my courage is the courage of desperation that is what he wrote in his jail diary so i will end up my answer with sure. this thank you uh, thank you so much is oishi still there can you hear us um anyway so i'll go ahead and thank you so much for this brilliant discussion and uh, you all also covered the topic of you know the role of women leader which uh, i mean i had questions for it but thank you for covering it anyway so we will close this discussion and thank you so much for coming here and um, thank you all for listening to us and uh, thank you so much swati and thank you waishi and thank you dipshita thank you uh, thank you for your bravery and for your leadership dipsita swati and aisha uh, it was great to hear you even as you're facing so many risks in your own lives and i think you inspire us and also uh, they are traveling so they are all working so that's what they could not join it and even like you know they were lost it just shows like you know the internet connection and their work like how busy they are with their life and how they are making the changes thank you we now uh, since we have been talking about the caa and the protest led by particularly by women our next interlude is a, a gujarati rendering of hum dekhenge which has become more or less the theme song of the 
anti CAA protests. Here it is. <laughs> साचे जमे देखीशु अमी आदिवस अफर वरदान समो लख्यो छे विधिनी लेखन थी आजोर जुलमना पहाड़ो पची उमड़ानी जे मुड़ी जाशे निये दीन दलितना पगतली आधरा धड़क से धड़ 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 सरमुख हत्यार माथे त्राटक से विजड़ी सण सणती काड़ 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 काबाना गर्भ गृहे थी सब पत्थरिया देव हटावाशे निर्मल दिलना वंचित सब गादी तक आरूढ़ थे ने मुगट बधा उछड़ी पाड़े ने मुगट बधा बस नाम रे शे मालिक जे अलोपने साक्षात सदा जे स्वयं दृश्य ने दृष्टा छे उठशे बधे लोगों हसे जे हूँ पढ़ छू ने तू पढ़ छे Thanks to India Writers Forum and India Cultural Forum, from which we were able to get this clipping. Thank you uh, for letting us share this. Uh, we want to move on to the next phase of our program. We've all talked about how, when we started this idea of this conference, that we all wanted not to have merely webinars that we listen to and go away but go away today and tomorrow with some very specific ideas on what each one of us is going to do as we move forward because the challenge is big it's almost like a david and goliath situation today so uh, i think we what i would like to do now is to introduce uh, two people from southern california shristi and sunita who will talk about something specific that some of us can do to take this fight forward. Christy, over to you. Your video, your audio, your. Oh, audio. okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Raju, for having me here to represent uh, the team of Gather Meet and Journal. Um, I would have said that this is a proud moment for me to speak in the company of such eminent names in the contemporary Indian civil society. But unfortunately, we are meeting in the backdrop of an India that is slipping into such a dark abyss that no one really seems, seems to dare to look into it. And therefore, I'm present here with, with a knot in my stomach, a sense of confusion and dread of what my India is becoming. But, but then I look around and I see there, that there are still faces here who've been fighting this battle for even longer than I've been born. 
and I and I see them still here, still fighting, and it makes me re realize what has been passed on to us by those fighting for a better India, by those still fighting for a better India, is worth loving and fighting for with all that we have in us. We are here to reclaim our India, a country where we live together with our differences. We had hands, not collars. We could come on streets and shout at the top of our voices without this fear of tightening noose around our necks. We could sing of Azadi without fear. That India, my friends, needs to be reclaimed. There must be another gather to free our country from caste, from chronism, from manuvad, patriarchy, homophobia, from this discrimination against religious minorities, from this naked dalali of hatred that is going on. This land mafia is grabbing land and displacing Adivasis from Chhattisgarh, Odisha, and other parts of the country. From this inhuman acts like AFSPA, from this misuse of state power against our own people in Kashmir and Northeast. And the list goes on and on. But we have to realize that not a single of these problems can be solved with the fascist Modi regime at the center and its lackeys across the Indian state. And no one group or, in, or, or individual or section of the society can fight such a fascist state alone. We have to come together and we have to come together now. We have attempted to achieve this through an initiative we call Gadar. And I would request all the attendees here to learn the history of Gadar Party. Our mission is basically to create a platform where diverse people and groups from different socio-political spectrum can come together and have a dialogue with this common goal of creating a progressive and forward-looking India. And, and to open up these channels of communication between groups and individuals working in isolation currently. This stemmed from this idea that we felt very strongly that the progressive voices in India and even here in the diaspora are just too fractured. And this fracture is only helping the fascist Hindutva forces to consolidate their dark grip. So it is my humble request, resolute and emphatic appeal to all the progressive groups here and to whoever in the world is listening to me. I ask you to come and join us. Criticize us and help build the platform. Let your differences and contradictions rest for another day when the political situation in India becomes more conducive of resolving those differences. But today, it is time to build a united front to fight this fascist regime in the country so that tomorrow we can sort out our own differences. I will just conclude with this here by expressing my gratitude to all our fellow activists in India. I, I don't have words to express my concern and respect for our comrades who are fighting under this dark shadows of laws like UAPA, where every night when they sleep, khakis lurk in the darkness to bubble them up. I, I salute them and I would want to shout out to them. We are listening and we are telling the world your story, our story. And with this, I would now yield the floor to Suniti, who has been leading this fasting chain for over 200 days now. In fact, it was um, a realization that how so many people didn't know about this effort, which is su such a successful campaign that initially motivated us to set up a platform like other. So I will yield the floor to Sneetha now. Thank you, Sri. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will kind of th uh, say what uh, a few words about the uh, chain fasting movement that we have been part of uh, in the form of a um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I'll share my screen if I uh, am allowed to. So there we go. Um, and present. So can you see my screen? Nope, we can't. You should share your screen. No, we, we can't. Okay, I'll just try again. Um, just a moment.
Do you see it now? Yep, good. All right. So thank you for bearing with me. And hello again. It is my pleasure and honor to tell you a few words about Chain Fasting for Peace, an ongoing fasting change uh, chain that has been fast fighting the spread of fascism in India. With uh, the support of fellow activists in Los Angeles, including Srishti, um, we started fasting on February the 25th this year with the singular demand that Home Minister Amit Shah resign for allowing the Northeast Delhi program to occur and under his watch. Uh, when we started fasting, each of us consuming only water and honey for five contiguous days, we did not know how long our, cha our, our chain could be sustained. To our very pleasant surprise, word spread quickly over Facebook, and thanks to a total of 30 selfless and committed volunteers, we have completed 222 unbroken days of fasting today. The atrocities have, unfortunately, but predictably, not stopped, but neither have we. We have become an online fasting family of sorts, each of us uh, from a diversity of backgrounds of the kind only India could produce, but with the common vision of India as a just, inclusive, safe, and prosperous home for all of us. Our protest started out of indignation at a repeat of Gujarat 2002 in Northeast Delhi, but has since become a sounding board for a wide range of protests after the physical means of protesting were severely cur curtailed by the advent of COVID-19. We have lent our platform formally to campaign for the public's right to dissent, as iconized by Prashant Bhushan's uh, steadfast res resistance in the face of contempt charges slapped on him by the Supreme Court of India. Our one day fast drew the enthusiastic participation of over a hundred fasters all over the world. We also supported a day long fast against the outrageous arrest of Umar Khalid and the increasingly widespread and uh, aggressive clampdowns on dissenting citizens that we have been witnessing over the past several months. Uh, with that, I will end my presentation. If you'd like to join us or get more information about us, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you're welcome to get in touch with us at uh, chainfastingforpeace at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Srishti. Thank you, Suniti. Uh, you really inspire us, Suniti, with this. Uh, as Suniti, as uh, Shristi was saying, uh, it took us several months after you started fasting to be aware that such thing was going on. And I, I live just a few hundred miles from you. So I think the idea of the gather meet that Shristi talked about more than the dialogue itself, just letting each other know across the world who we are and what we are doing so we don't duplicate our effort, we can borrow from each other because that is the only way we are going to enlarge this movement against what is going on in India. And uh, Shristi, if you could share in the chat room or in the uh, any, any way people that are listening today could contact you, I think that would be very, very helpful. Yes, I'll just put my email ID here. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me, uh, I'm tasked with the, uh, I don't know whether we are on time or not, but uh, first, first thing I want to thank people uh, behind the scenes who've been trying to keep this webinar today on time. Yes, we are on time. So thank you. Thank you for all the people. I, I don't want to individually name, there are so many people that made today what it is. Uh, I'm simply not able to thank everyone individually. Thanks everyone who listened, everyone that made this happen. Uh, more uh, not enviable, not uh, more difficult, I say, is the idea of uh, trying to crystallize the things that happened today into a summary. I, I think it's a very hard task given so much that has happened. 
but I just jotted down a few things that I thought I would share with you. Uh, one, of course, was the very idea that when we talk about reclaiming India, we are talking about reclaiming which India? And that is a question that should bother all of us so we can each in our own minds talk about what, which India are we trying to reclaim? And in uh, Ramachandra Guha's conversation, uh, he reminded us of the six ways in which the current administration in India has emasculated India. Now, he did mention language as one of them, which many of you may not be aware of. And I thought I would just remind you uh, that the national education policy that was apparently developed with professionals at the helm is also being used, in my view, by this government to achieve their own ends by forcing a three language formula as another means of consolidating the Hindutva. And please do look at websites that have national education policy, which was initially written by professionals as a two language formula, which has been successful all these years. And in my, what I have heard is their arms were twisted to change it to a three language formula in the last minute by the government. So it is very, very important that we keep track of that. Uh, Ramachandra Guha also talked about the social media's role. And I, a few days ago, I asked him if there is any risk if the protests continue, if the government could shut down social media and internet in other parts of the country, like in Kashmir. Uh, his view was, no, no, that is not likely. And I realized one thing, just as it is now going to be a tool for us to share with each other, I don't think this government can afford to shut down the primary means of their spreading hate. So we have an advantage there. That's one thing they cannot afford to do because if they do, they will also be shutting down hate. Uh, Ramachandra Guha also referred to, in terms of action items, the Association for Democratic Reforms. This is an organization that I've particularly been uh, working with for some time now. For those of you that may not be aware, this was started by a group of professors in IIM Ahmedabad and uh, Dr. Trilochan Shastri, who may be listening to us today, and I hope he is, uh, has been very active. And if today we at least have made a beginning in India of uh, people, candidates disclosing their criminal records or uh, cases against them, that would not have been possible without the work of ADR, who have tried to remain above politics but uh, please look at Association for Democratic Reforms if you want to follow that track in terms of keeping up with the political. And they're also talking a lot about the electoral bonds uh, that uh, Ram Guha mentioned earlier. Uh, moving on to the fantastic discussion with, between Raj Mohan Gandhi and Reverend Barber, again, uh, I know we got very small part of their conversation. It is a lovely conversation that I would urge you all to listen to. Uh, I just wanted to highlight again what was mentioned that African American Gandhi statement that African Americans will one day teach India about nonviolence. And this is a call for action to all of us to work closely with minorities here and work with groups like Black Lives Matter. And one of the things I wanted to mention is in early next year, there, when I think it's the 60th anniversary of the Selma March. And if COVID permitting, I, my ambition is if all of us can come together to put together a progressive India contingent to go and join our African-American brothers and sisters uh, to celebrate what civil rights has made it possible for us in this country without which we will not be here. Punya and the track on Hindutva and Hinduism, as Punya mentioned, there's a lot of internal dialogue that needs to happen among Hindus. I know there are probably people here today who will tell us that there is no such thing as a progressive Hinduism and Hinduism without caste is going to be virtually impossible. And I understand that. I understand that sentiment, but progressive Hindus like me and some of the panelists that you heard, we have no choice. We have to reassert that part of Hinduism that has driven us all these years. And without that, we will continue to leave a vacuum which the Sang Parivar is happy to occupy, whether it's in the US or in India. And it is our obligation and duty, if you are a progressive Hindu, to stay 
true to your values and speak up so that we replace some of the vacuum that has been unfortunately been created. As far as the conversation on the Dalits, uh, Dr. Roja, Martin, uh, McQuan, and Bal Murli, I was very impressed. And today, I can proudly say to Martin, I, I too aspire to be a Dalit according to your definition, Martin. And I was going to wear a mask with that saying I'm a Dalit, but I couldn't find one. Uh, I think Martin also made a point about uh, quoting Ambedkar about uh, you know dharma being something internal, something that you observe. But when dharma crossovers and tries to erase a constitution, we have a serious problem. And uh, I, if I may, I just want to quote uh, something that Martin has told me over the years when we were talking about discrimination when he went to uh, a Christian school uh, without having to say. P, uh, pay fees, uh, the children, Dalit children who were allowed to be educated in that place because they were not paying any fees were asked to sweep the floors of the school when other children were playing. And that is really, really etched in Martin's mind. And I, I with his permission, I'm sharing that with you. Uh, as I, and then moving on to the next, um, discussion between uh, between us and the three women in Delhi. Uh, one thing I just wanted to pick on, I think Swati mentioned about making a distinction between truth and the narrative. I just want to give one example of that. When CAA, the narrative on the CAA is it's for refugees and she pointed out how it's a blatant lie. If that is the case, why is there a deadline of 2014? But let me point out another narrative which is different from the truth where statements are being made that Muslim citizens of India have nothing to worry. This has been made. Think about that statement. It says Muslim citizens of India don't have to worry. They're not saying Muslims in India don't have anything to worry. What they end up playing games with those kinds of words, narratives, because if you haven't decided who a citizenship, or who a citizen is, and Muslims are at the risk of losing their citizenship, what good is a statement saying Muslim citizens don't have anything to worry? So there is another example of truth versus narrative. Uh, and uh, let me close with this. Um, I, I don't think I've done full justice to everything we heard today. Um, tried my best. But tomorrow, I think we have an even more exciting set of panels that I would urge all of you to dial into. Uh, we have the former vice president of India, Hamid Ansari, in a conversation with Arfa Sherwani from The Wire. We have Prashant Bhushan and Indira Jaising in a live appearance. We have another round table of student activists, both from India and the US, led by students against Hindutva ideology. And we have another important conversation about prisoners of conscience, prisoners in India, which is building up even as we speak uh, with Tista Satalwad and Mihir Desai, led by Madhumita Datta of ICWI. And we're going to then have a conversation on the role of art and culture in preserving Indian democracy with Atish Tasir and Richa Pillai from Chennai and Simranjit Singh. And we end on the note of talking about freedom of press in India, led by Paranjoy Thakurta and Akriti Bhatia. Now, following the end of the main conference tomorrow, we have also planned, some of the organizations have also planned what we have called as extra inning, where we are going to spend an hour talking about the political future of India. So please do join us tomorrow, same time. And uh, with that- I'll Raju, bring... Raju, yeah. Raju. Yeah, sure. Uh, may I just say just one thing quickly? Sure, please. Yeah, I see Dr. Hamid Ansari are, uh, has been on the call. So can we just ask him uh, to just oh. say a few words in the closing? Absolutely. Yeah. He's been it on can, the call since can morning. Can the moderator so. please recognize uh, Dr. Hamid Ansari, former vice president of India. I'm, I, my apologies, I didn't know he was online. Thank you. Would it be possible to give him the floor? Well, he has to unmute himself because he's muted and his video is closed. Oh. 
I have requested him, but okay. Let's wait uh, a few seconds. See if he would be able yeah. to come on. While we are waiting, if any of the organizers have anything else to just add to tomorrow's meeting in a one-liner, please do so while we are waiting. Well, I'd like to thank all attendees. And in case your questions were not answered, uh, it's not because of lack of interest. It's because we kind of ran over time. But definitely, please engage us on social media. And we'll definitely answer your questions. And I would like all of you to be part of this movement because it's a people-led movement. Uh, Manish, what we will do is uh, contact uh, Vice President Hamid Ansari to request him to join again live if he would tomorrow. So before that particular panel, we can give him a few minutes to speak live with the rest of us. Right. Th I think thank you all. Good. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the Saturday and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow at 9 a.m. New York time, 6.30 p.m. India time. And please urge those you know who registered, who could not be here with us today to please join us tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye.